Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today is the second Sunday of the month, which means it's time for Nutrition Insights with Dr. Peter Rogers. And today he's going to be discussing the skinny on fats. Please welcome back very popular Dr. Peter Rogers. How are you doing today, Dr. Rogers? Good. Good. So it's Super Bowl Sunday. Any plans to watch the game? Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I used to be friends with a bunch of football players, but I've kind of lost touch with football. Uh, I don't I don't I don't watch the game anymore. Yeah, I've never seen one. Do you, I'm just curious, though. Do you actually have a, do you own a television? No, I don't. I haven't watched TV in many decades. That's interesting because I, I own one, but I don't have cable. So in, in, in essence, I can't watch it anyway, you know, so um, that's really interesting. Well, thank you. So this topic, you know, this in the plant-based world, there can be a lot of disagreement on fat, like good fat, bad fat, oil, good oil, bad, how many nuts and seeds do you need them? And also I'm very interested in your presentation. Yeah. Well, thanks. It's, it's an interesting subject. Well, I can't wait. Do you want me to start showing slides? Please, I can see the first one. Yeah, wow. so the first one was, you know, you go to a hospital and one of the things you notice and you start walking around the hallways at a hospital and you see one fat staff person after another, fat secretaries, fat nurses, fat technologists, and there's a lot of fat doctors too. And so what I'm saying is obesity is tied right in with the major Western diseases, atherosclerosis, hypertension, diabetes. So what I'm saying is they can't save themselves. How are they going to save you? Okay. And don't get me wrong. I've got some friends that are really good in their narrow specialty, but they're still fat. So they do know they're high tech stuff, but they're still fat. So yeah, you know what I'm saying? You go to a health club and everybody tends to look pretty fit, pretty strong. They lift weights. They're into fitness, but you go to a hospital and they don't even have good fitness themselves. And also it becomes a bigger deal too with the patients, post-op patients. You know, a lot of them, any hospital you'll ever see, they're often fed high fat diets, real sick people. And that's going to diminish oxygen delivery to the tissues. That's not a good thing. So doctors just aren't trained in nutrition, epidemiology, and toxicology. And those are very important subjects. Another big thing that's going on at the universities, many of them are going bankrupt because more education is going online. You know, the economy is getting worse. So people don't want to go to college or they can't pay for college or they want to go online. So what I'm saying is there's all these beautiful buildings with their nice uh, quadrangles for parks, for walking around and stuff. So I think we ought to turn some of these into fat camps. Now, I'm not a businessman, but if somebody else wants to do this, gets a university and they want to, you know, give lectures in a day, it's perfect. The people can come stay for, you know, a week or two weeks a month, like in the old Kempner days. And then you give them some educational lectures in the day. They get a little exercise. They go to the cafeteria and they, you know, have a buffet. They learn to pick out their meals. I think there's a lot of potential in this. Colleges turned into fat camps. Okay, and what I'm saying here too about health and nutrition, we already know what works. We know that, you know, Walter Kempner's rice houses in Durham, North Carolina with Duke University were tremendously successful. He saw over 19,000 patients and Duke sort of built up their hospital medical system around his uh, rice diet clinics. Okay, and, you know, they would have weigh-ins for the patients and people would migrate from all over the world, actually, not even just the United States to go you know, be taken care of by Dr. Kempner and the rest of his staff there. Um, so this is just showing them have weigh-ins and stuff, you know, the personal element of it. Uh, so this is, it's already proven that it works, okay? Um, he had patients reversing diabetic retinopathy, hypertensive retinopathy, of course, massive obesity, um, some reversals of CHF even. And there's been case reports now coming out more and more about reversal of uh, CHF in particular. There's a cardiologist who's been writing about that. I think it's Dr. Osterfeld. Okay, anyways, uh, getting back to Dr. Esselstyn now. You know, the low-fat, low-sodium vegan diet has been shown capable of halting coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular disease, atherosclerosis, and, you know, he had 99.4% of his patients with no recurrent coronary artery events. And Dr. Esselstyn described this as uh, being like getting free of the sword of Damocles. You know, the sword of Damocles was, you know, the story of Damocles was the king, and this one guy wanted to know what it was like to be king, and Damocles said, go ahead, you see what it's like. The king is always stressed out and worried about things. So he thought it wasn't that much fun to have that hanging over his head. And what I'm saying is low-fat vegan, it's a way you can avoid atherosclerosis. I mean, it works. And it's the only thing I'm aware of that works. And I've been studying it for decades, since over 25 years. 
Okay. And, uh, you know, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no disease because the low-fat vegan diet's by my side. I'm not afraid of atherosclerosis. I mean, it's a totally preventable thing. You know, whatever get me in trouble is I piss somebody off. Okay. But anyways, also you can hear all these people saying, well, paleo, keto, carnivore, low carb, it's all just as good. No, it's not. And the way you can stop the poser, so to speak, um, is just tell them, look, low fat vegan diet. It's the only diet that's been shown to reduce coronary artery disease. If you think your diet can do it, go ahead, run a, run a study, do a randomized control study. You don't even do randomized control. Just show it in a significant number of patients. We'd love to see it. Okay. So I kind of joked that Esselstyn's like an Old Testament prophet. You know, he's kind of very unflinching, no oil. And I think that's an important point. I think that's a big part of why his diet works. And he also says no nuts. Okay. Now, if you're totally healthy, you can get away with it. But what I'm sort of saying here is we've already discovered, you know, as close as we're going to get to the promised land of health, if you will, to avoid atherosclerosis, hypertension, diabetes type two. And so I'm not a big fan of all this going back to the high fat foods. You know, I know nuts can taste good and they're a relatively safe source of fats, but all this nuts and chia and flax and almonds and then fish oil or algae, algae omega-3s and then avocado, soy, high fat. Um, I'm like, you know, you want to get expelled from the promised land, spend another 40 years wandering in the desert. We already got what works. We already made it as good as we're going to get as far as I'm aware. We should actually be studying how to make a low-fat vegan diet better. But I don't think there's money in that, so people aren't doing it. But I think that's a mistake, you know? Don't be grateful for what you have. And when you change it, be careful how you change it. That's where the research should be. And, and not much research happens on stuff unless it's profitable. Okay, I actually think the only good fats are fiber fat. And what I mean by that is fiber gets converted into short-chain fatty acids by your gut bacteria. And then there's also, of course, fats that we need, but they're in very minimal amounts. And we get them from just um, in plant foods. We get omega-3s and omega-6. The only two essential fats are like the linoleic acid in um, omega-6, C18-2, 18 carbons, two double bonds, or linolenic acid, the 18-3 with three double bonds. Okay, we talked about this before, you know, the bliss point. Uh, basically, the, the food companies mix just the right amounts of salt, sugar, and fat, throw in a little glutamate, right mouse texture, and you get addicted to all these processed foods, but they're really bad for your health. I think people underestimate how fat a lot of these nuts are. It's pretty routine for nuts to be anywhere from about 70% to about 90% fat. That's a lot of fat. The other thing is I know flax is real popular. It's a plant source of alpha linolenic acid, you know, the omega-3 precursor. Um, so I get that, but, you know, I'm still not that big a fan of it. You know, soy can be like thousands of times more estrogenic than other foods. And flax is far more estrogenic than soy. And so like the last thing I would want, you know, I want to be a macho man, okay, a wrestler, a tough guy. I don't want to be eating estrogenic fat. Why in the world would I seek that out? Now, people might say, theoretically, there's a benefit. Oh, you get those omega-3s, they're going to do you some good. I actually don't think so. I actually think people are over overdosing on them. But we'll, we'll come to that later. Okay, and there's lots of problems with soy and it's high fat, not to mention all kinds of other problems. We talked about that in previous lectures. And by the way, this is what I say. I'm the bad boy of veganism. People always get mad at me. And like, my job's not to, you know, to make you love me. My job's to tell you the truth. You could take it or leave it, okay? But I'm going to tell you it as I see it, as my studies have shown, as the papers show. Okay, um, this is just showing you how fat other foods are. <clears throat> like oatmeal for me is a high fat food, even though I think oatmeal is a good food. Plain oatmeal. It's about 16% fat. Quinoa is in the same ballpark, 14%. Garbanzo is a relatively, I would consider a relatively fat bean at 13%, but still a good food. I don't like this idea of soy being 40% fat, of the calories and fat. That's too much. Um, I like, I actually like lentils a lot. Lentils are only about 3% fat. Black beans about 4% fat. And then, you know, the lower the percentage of calories from fat, the skinnier the population tends to be. White rice in the ballpark of 1%, same with potatoes and sweet potatoes. Those are foods I think are great to keep you skinny, avoid diabetes and um, hypertension. And when you avoid those two diseases, you avoid the risk of lots of other diseases, including stroke, et cetera. Okay, um, just a tiny bit of, uh, of chemistry here. You know, um, methane is CH4, so carbon with four hydrogens. And related to that is a methyl group at the end of a molecule with three hydrogens. But the one we're gonna really talk about today is methylene group. So that's a carbon bound to two hydrogens, okay? And the carbon and the hydrogen have a similar, what is called electronegativity, meaning a desire to grab electrons. And because of that, molecules that primarily have carbon and hydrogens bound like this 
they're nonpolar. They don't have a charge on them. So they are soluble in oil, but they're not soluble in water. And that's going to come up again as well. Um, you know, ethane right here is just two carbons and you know, make it uh, like ethanol is like the typical drinking alcohol. Okay, one important concept to get is that fat is a dry storage of energy. You store fat all over your body and you don't need hardly any water uh, to do that, almost none. Versus in your liver where you store glycogen, that's your glucose storage, a polymer of glucose. And that's very different. You got about three molecules of a water for each molecule of glycogen. The point being is it's wet. And that would mean you can't store that much. You can store enough glycogen really for, they say for two days, but a lot of that's combined with gluconeogenesis. So you're really only getting about one to two days of glucose storage in the form of glycogen in your liver to maintain your blood glucose level for the whole body. You store some glycogen as well in your skeletal muscles, but for maintaining blood glucose level to keep your brain optimized, we don't have that much of it, okay? Because fat is not soluble in water, you can store it in a dry form without having to add water to it. And you can store obviously tremendous amounts of that. As long as you're drinking water, you know, it can keep you alive for two months. Okay, um, another thing to know, just a little bit of chemistry here is that when you have a carbon like this, with a double bond to oxygen, that's called a carbonyl group. When you have an OH group on it, a hydroxyl group, or sometimes we'll call that an alcohol group, this is called a carboxylic acid. Okay, so all fatty acids are going to have a carboxylic acid at the end of the molecule. Uh, when it's deprotonate, you just pronounce it eight. So instead of calling it the ic acid, carboxylic acids end in ic. When you uh, deprotonate it, you'll, you'll pronounce it by the eight, okay? So acetic acid becomes acetate. Uh, that's just going to come up all the time, so it's good for you to know it. Okay, the other one you're going to want to know about, let's say you have butyric acid. You need to know this one because this is what the good gut bacteria give to the gut to prevent leaky gut. It has four carbons. And uh, when it's deprotonated, you call it butyrate. And that's the one that prevents leaky gut. That's going to come up all the time. Okay, a little bit more on fatty acid structure. And so I, we're only going to go through a little bit of this. And I'm just saying it to you because you're going to hear about this endlessly. And once you just get a few things, you'll be able to handle whatever comes your way on the topic of fat. Okay, so a fat has a polar end, whereas the carboxylic acid here, double bond to the oxygen, carbonyl group, and then a hydroxyl group, alcohol group, OH group. And this is polar because electronegativity of oxygen is much stronger. It really wants to grab electrons in comparison with the carbon, okay? And then the rest is just hydrogens and carbons, okay? You can number them. We'll number them from this side. The methyl end uh, that ends in a methyl group, this is also the omega end. So when we count here, one, two, three, on the third carbon double bond, that would be an omega-3 fat. We count four, five, six, a double bond beginning at the six carbon, that would be an omega-6 fat. So that's why we're going to count like that. I like to count from this side. It just works better. Um, let's see, what else do we know? This is nonpolar over here, just carbons and hydrogens because electronegativities of carbon and hydrogen are very similar. And fatty acids are amphipathic, which means like an amphibian could live on water and on land in the sense that they're water soluble in part. Well, they, they can interact with water, it depends on the length of the molecule, but they have a component that's polar that is water soluble, just the carboxylic acid. And then they have a, a component that's hydrophobic, that doesn't like fat. Um, and that is this long chain of uh, carbon and hydrogens. And that will be relevant because a molecule that's got a little bit of both can do interesting things. They can be detergents, they can be emulsifiers. Okay, and that's gonna come up uh, again later. Oh, this slide. Okay, so this right here is a sat fat. Slide got uh, clipped off a little bit, but a sat fat means saturated with hydrogens in the carbon tail. So there's no double bonds. And these are relatively solid. Like if you leave a pizza out on your uh, table overnight, it sol solidifies, okay? MUFA is a monounsaturated, meaning one double bond. And the classic uh, MUFA is like uh, olive oil, oleic acid, okay? Um, C18 with one double bond. And then here is a PUFA, it should be a P right there, polyunsaturated fatty acid. That means two or more double bonds. And the big important thing to get on PUFAs is that You'll have the double bond here starting at six. So this is an omega-6 fat. And then there's going to be a carbon in, in between the double bonds that is spare. This is how they typically go. They just skip one carbon. And this carbon here is called the methylene bridge. Remember, we talked about a methylene group being a carbon with two hydrogens. I'm only drawing the one hydrogen here. And the relevance is these double bonds are pulling on the electrons such that this hydrogen is very primed to be plucked off. And then oxygen is going to come right in here and bind to this methylene bridge carbon. And... The more of these methylene bridge carbons you have, and some of these 
uh, fatty acids will have a whole bunch of them, like a like a DHA, the, the fish oil fat, because it's got, you know, six double bonds. It's very prone to lipid peroxidation, which is a bad thing. OK, that's why they store it in a radio pay container and say, get it into the refrigerator as fast as you can. All right. So you, you need to know that, though. This is the methyl N, the omega N. This is how we count. And this is the methylene bridge carbon. That's a super important point to get the methylene bridge carbon. OK, and the, the way the typical, uh, let's say, linoleic acid is written is C18-2. So C18 means there's 18 carbons and the two means there's two double bonds. This is sort of like an omega symbol. They'll sometimes use an N as well. But what this means is that omega-6, it starts on the six carbon. And a lot of times they won't list the other fat, the other carbons for the other double bonds because it doesn't really matter. You know they're just going to skip one carbon and you can figure them out anyways. But so you'll typically see linoleic acid is C182W6, OK, omega-6. Um, a little bit about phospholipids. I won't talk about these too much, but you, you should know about them, just the idea of a membrane. So a typical membrane, you got these polar uh, phospholipid heads right here. I draw them circles in purple. And then you got the fatty acid tail sticking into the hydrophobic part of the phospholipid bilayer. Every cell in the human body is enclosed in these phospholipid bilayers, okay? So the aqueous solution, water-like of the ECM extracellular matrix, is in contact with the phospholipid head. Same thing with the cytoplasm that is also aqueous, water-like. Okay, here's the structure of a phospholipid. You have a backbone like glycerol with three carbons in a row. And typically one carbon will be bound to a saturated fatty acid. Quite often one of them will be bound to an unsaturated fatty acid, okay? And then the third carbon will be bound to a phosphate and that's bound to some type of other polar group, choline, serine, um, ethanolamine. Okay, those are just some common ones you hear. Phosphatidyl and acetyl. Um, HIP2, it's often abbreviated there. So this will come up a lot. And remember, this is the aqueous part, like these little purple heads here. And this is the hydrophobic part, the center of the phospholipid bilayer of a membrane. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about saturated fat. And saturated fat, it's very stable. So what's great about it is it doesn't uh, react with oxygen. So it's, 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 it's not going to be affected by lipid peroxidation. And that, and that is a good thing, okay? But some downsides about saturated fat is it is, it's typically the fat coming from animal food, by the way. So when I hear saturated fat, I sort of think animal fat. I mean, I know there's some exceptions like coconut oil and there's some sat fat in nuts and a few other things. But in general, when you hear sat fat, you should think animal fat. And you know, any fat, it makes you gain weight. The more fat you eat, the higher your risk of becoming obese, which associates to an increased risk of hypertension, diabetes, et cetera, and elevated blood lipids. And the fatter you get, the more your fat tissue has the aromatase enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen. So that's another reason why you don't want to be fat. Um, saturated fat raises LDL cholesterol. LDL cholesterol is associated with atherosclerosis. And that's been shown a long time ago. Mr. Fitz study with you know, 3, 355,000 men. Is that a big enough sample set for you there? And a bunch of other studies. So it's significantly atherogenic. It's also uh, diabetogenic and increases the risk of diabetes. Once you have diabetes, a whole bunch of other bad things start happening. You get immunocompromised. You start producing AGEs, advanced glycation end products. You start thickening your capillary basement membranes and decreasing your ability to deliver oxygen to your tissues in the brain. That's making you stupider throughout the rest of your body. That's increasing your cancer risk by causing tissue ischemia, lack of oxygen. Okay, Hyperinsulinemia means that you're, you know insulin comes up because of insulin resistance. So that's also mitogenic, okay? It has like an mTOR activation effect to increase the tendency of cells to divide, and that's thought to increase your risk of cancer, okay? Um, diabetes, like I said, it suppresses the immune system. So the net result is you, you don't really want to be doing this. You, you end up being more diabetogenic, hypertensive, and ischemic all throughout your body. There's a whole bunch of papers about the problems with um, uh, saturated fat. And of course, you know, Esselstyn's doesn't allow any animal products, uh, Dean Ornish also showed, you know, the same thing that you could reverse coronary artery disease, pretty extraordinary. And that's been shown in animal studies too. Um, just minimize their dietary fat. The way you cause atherosclerosis in animal studies, feed them eggs, you know, like, um, William Roberts said, any herbivore, you feed them a high fat diet, they all get atherosclerosis. They're just not made for those diets. What are some other good things in here? Um, this was the Peter Quo studies those done in the 1950s. The ones where they showed that you would cause tissue hypoxia by feeding um, high fat diets, vegetable oils, like omega-6 fats and saturated fats. Um, let's see, there was one I wanna show, oh, Blankenhorn. The Blankenhorn study is a good one from 1978. 
like cardiology research. And they showed no matter what fat it was, it could be sat fat, it could be MUFA, it could be PUFA, all of them increased atherosclerosis. And the only way to prevent atherosclerosis was to reduce total fat intake. Okay. And Dr. McDougall wrote about this in his book, Start Solution. It's actually, I wrote the page number here on page 136. Okay. So that's useful to know. All right. And fats tend to increase a uh, blood coagulation factor number seven, have that slight prothrombotic effect. You know, I know the omega threes can have a little bit of an anti thrombotic effect too. And we'll talk about that later. It's a pretty minor effect though. Uh, I say that because, you know, I did a fellowship in vascular intervention radiology at Harvard many years ago. I've done like many thousands of procedures. I can tell you, I never once paid attention to omega-3s. I just do the case. We don't even care if they're on omega-3s, okay? We don't care if they're on aspirin too. I put in tons of portocast. It never once affected my cases, gave me any problems, and we never paid any attention to it. Now, Plavix is a big deal. You put a patient on Plavix, that's a strong anticoagulation medication. I've had patients where I've been forced for clinical reasons to do procedures like put in chest tubes, for example, or uh, percutaneous cholecystostomy, gallbladder drainage tubes. And I've had some bleeds on Plavix and I'm sitting there holding for like over an hour uh, when, you know, I had to do the case, but I've had other cases where I got away with it, but um, I don't like doing a case when the patient's on Plavix. All right, here's just showing when somebody eats a high fat meal, the plasma in the blood, of, this is just a test tube where it sediments out. Here's the red blood cells, here's the white blood cells, and then here's where the plasma is. And normally you can see through it, almost read through it, but it gets real opaque once you eat a high fat meal, just sort of like a physical effect it has on the blood. Normally, red blood cells have a zeta potential, a negative charge on their outer surface, like from cholesterol sulfates, from their sialic acids, their heparin sulfates, and their glycocalyx, and they repel each other because of that. You know, negative charge repel other negative charge. But you get bridging molecules like LDL cholesterol. That's why cholesterol is a major risk factor for atherosclerosis. Fibrinogen, that's why stress is a risk factor. It's an acute phase reactant. It gets released by the liver in the setting of stress. Uric acid, which relates also to the high fructose corn syrup excesses. Um, that kept becoming elevated in the blood. IgM antibodies, the increased tendency to thrombosis with uh, acute infection, severe acute infection. Um, also LPS, lipopolysaccharide from gram-negative bacteria and LTA, lipotychoic uh, acid from gram-positive bacteria. When you got leaky gut and the bacteria are able to get their endotoxin into the body, those are also quite prothrombotic. Okay, uh, we talked about how so the bridging molecule sticks the red blood cells together. Red blood cells about... Uh, seven microns in diameter. Capillary is about five microns in diameter. So it has to deform a little to, to get through that capillary. And the point being is when you stick a bunch of red blood cells together, it's harder to get them through the capillary. So now you're, it's like you're pumping a milkshake instead of water, the pressure has to go up, okay, to push them through the capillary. All right. Um, Roy Swank was, you know, a famous neurologist out from Canada who went to Oregon, working with all the multiple sclerosis patients. And he later, you know, was friends with McDougal and he did some work with Dr. McDougal. But the point is he had done a lot of research on the effect of uh, fat on blood flow. And he felt that saturated fat was especially bad. It also turned out Ray Rosenman and Meyer Friedman in the 1960s showed that um, omega-6 fats were just as bad or actually worse than saturated fat. But anyways, getting back to Roy Swank, he felt that the tissue ischemia, lack of oxygen caused by um, the high fat meals sludging the red blood cells together was leading to damage to the blood-brain barrier. And he felt that that was increasing permeability whereby the autoantibodies you know, with molecular mimicry and autoantibody cross-reactivity from the dairy proteins was facilitating the saturated fat uh, foods was facilitating those antibodies entering the brain parenchyma and thus inducing uh, brain damage of multiple sclerosis. So here's more of Roy Swank's papers. Uh, fat equals thick blood can injure the blood-brain barrier. And he was showing the prolonged thickening of the blood with the um, by the chylomicron. So the chylomicrons can also do it too, in a sense, be like a bridging molecule to thicken the blood. There's a nice movie, uh, Dr. McDougall has it only about 50 seconds long uh, where they show this. It was done by Swank, but McDougall got, you know, got it and put it on his site to show, you know, how the blood gets thick. Okay. And that's also why you go to a greasy spoon. It's only about 50 seconds long. I, I recommend it. I think it's worth, worth watching. You remember it the rest of your life. Okay. So basically when the blood's thick, you don't deliver as much oxygen to the tissues. And like we're saying, the sat fat was only going to stay real thick for a couple of hours. This is a, done in a paper by Peter Kuo. Uh, the reference was in there earlier. I had that reference when I went through all those references to this paper. It was done in the 1950s. So basically, he'd feed them a high fat meal with saturated fat, check their blood lipids every 30 minutes. And uh, what he found was that the peak in the blood lipids, that's when they had a peak in their angina. These were cardiac angina patients who get chest pain in response to decrease oxygen to the heart muscle maximum angina at peak lipemia due to maximum fat in the blood. 
Okay, and then later on, this work was repeated, like by Ray Rosenman and Meyer Friedman, they found that the unsaturated fats, your omega-6 cooking oils were even worse, more prolonged blood sludging, thick blood, rouleau formation, you know, sack of coins, that means in French, the red blood cells sticking together. And his workers were actually getting ticked off at him because they would start at eight o'clock in the morning. And this was going on and on and on, the unsaturated fat. Oil's kind of like a big mess in the blood. It sticks to everything. Like when you do your dishes to clean it up, it's a big mess. Okay, actually, here's the movie right here. Blood sludge, blood flow, before and after a high fat meal. Here's Roy Swank's paper showing all the red blood cells stuck together and how that was decreasing tissue oxygen. He would also measure it like in a hamster brain, and he felt that it could even get up to 30% drop in oxygen delivery. Yeah, here it is. Roy Swank measured in hamsters after a high fat meal, a 30% drop in O2 to the brain. Okay. Uh, you know, and the, and the Peter Cole paper is like 15 to 20%. And they've, they've checked this. You know, Ray Rosenman and Meyer Freeman, they were one of them was an ophthalmologist. So they would check in the eyes. Um, watching the, the vessels shrink and, and constrict. Um, and then it's also been checked under the tongue in humans, sublingual, you know, when you got the belly opened up during a surgery. So I actually know an ophthalmologist who's, who's working on this right now. All right, well, anyways, oxygen available in brain tissue after lipid meals. This is, you know, again, Roy Swank. And he said, um, he said, let's see here. The reduction was greatest after cream and other highly saturated fats. So he thought sat fats were the worst for causing tissue hypoxia. It was least after the very unsaturated oils. Um, safflower, I know, is like an omega-6. And then changes after olive, corn, cottonseed, and other vegetable oils were intermediate. Okay, so he felt olive oil was in the middle level of, of causing tissue hypoxia. And then, you know, when you get to Otto Warburg theory that um, the more hypoxia you make a tissue, the more likely you are to induce cancer. And I think that's also why, that's a metabolic theory of cancer, by the way, that when you make tissue ischemic from scarring, scarring around asbestos, scarring around hepatitis, um, that'll increase the risk of cancer developing in the residual normal tissue that's trapped in there and subsequently becomes hypoxic. And thus it can injure the mitochondria in that cell and it can either die as it often does, or it can transform to become cancer-like, like run like an anaerobic bacteria on um, glycolysis. All right. So anyways, high blood pressure, the blood comes up, hits the median divider at a bifurcation. This would be external carotid going to your face, internal carotid going up to your brain, bounces off the median divider, and because it was coming in under high pressure, there's increased amount of turbulent flow, chaotic flow, increased amount of retrograde flow, like eddy currents, retrograde flow. And you'll just tend to, it'll tend to be in a sense confusing to the endothelium. It's, it, it, it's, it recognizes being like an injury and it starts to uh, shed its antithrombotic glycocalyx, its coating and express prothrombotic molecules. And you'll tend to form clots right at that spot. Atherosclerosis is the blood clot, by the way. That's the key to understanding atherosclerosis. Once you understand that, you'll be able to understand atherosclerosis. Until you understand that, it'll never really make sense for you. Okay, so anyways, then you end up in a steady state of clotting and removing clots. So the way you get yourself you know, um, healthy is you, you go low fat, low sodium vegan. Then you have your best chance to get away from hypertension and from um, atherosclerosis. The most important thing you know about endothelial cells, is they make a lot of nitric oxide. It's a gas. It diffuses into the lumen of the vessel, inhibits the platelets from clotting, diffuses into the wall of the artery, inhibits the vascular smooth muscles from uh, contracting. So it vasodilates the artery, which is what you want. It does other things, but that's the most important thing to know. Here's an atherosclerosis. It's really a blood clot. And the people who figure this out were the pathologists. They look at it under a microscope. They go, it's a blood clot. <laughs> okay, and so you can see parts of it are reversible. The acute uh, part of the clot, uh, with all the red cells and the other uh, material in there, like uh, LDL cholesterol, the lipid core, accumulated fat within the macrophages, um, the carotid core, dead cell, dead tissue material, that's all reversible. It's much more difficult to reverse the calcifications or the fibrous tissue, the collagen, especially the acellular collagen, okay? Uh, but you can often reverse this other stuff. That can be reabsorbed. Plus, once the cell um, starts to no longer be exposed to the sodium, to the other things that are toxic to the endothelial nitric oxide synthase, it'll start making more nitric oxide vasodilator and the artery will, will dilate because it's got uh, nitric oxide reestablished, okay? Okay, MUFAs, this is like olive oil. And I drew here the bed of Odysseus and Penelope. So Odysseus was the hero of the Trojan Wars. And then the second part, you know, it's the Iliad and the Odyssey, the idiot and the oddity. And so basically he then had to make his way home in, in the part two, the Odyssey. Okay. So it's like a long journey to find his way back to his dear wife, Penelope. So he'd been separated. By the time he got back there, they'd been apart almost 20 years. Okay. So anyways, one part of the, uh, the story was, you know, she talked to him about the bet. 
Okay. Their bed was built around an olive tree. And I have some Greek friends and they get mad at me if I ever say anything negative about olive oil. It's so intrinsic to the culture and historical, but you know, it's a, it's nice to know about it, but I don't think it's a good thing to eat. Uh, but anyways, that's the bed of Odysseus and Penelope. Okay. Olive oil. What's good. I mean, it tastes really good. Uh, because it's a MUFA, it doesn't have a methylene bridge carbon, so it's much less prone to lipid peroxidation than are the PUFAs. Um, what's bad about it? Well, it's pretty expensive, and it's highly profitable, and a lot of times it gets faked, meaning that people will put an olive oil label on something that's not necessarily olive oil. So you got to know what you're doing if you end up buying that stuff. Um, it still increases insulin resistance. It's still you know, concentrated liquid fat super high caloric density. What does Chef AJ say? The way to lose weight is to lower your caloric density. Um, it's not an essential fat. The body can make it. So you don't need it. It increases insulin resistance, meaning it increases diabetes risk. It has a, you know, a relatively mild, but it still has a negative effect on arterial flow mediated dilation of your arterial blood vessels. Um, when you get olive oil, it's typically not pure olive oil, MUFA, oleic acid, you know, uh, MUFA with a, the double bond to nine position. It'll also contain some sat fat, like around 10 to 14%. It'll also contain some PUFAs in there, including omega sixes, et cetera. Okay. So what else about olive oil? Um, here is just showing one set of, uh, of, of fatty acids that were in, um, an olive oil thing. What's in the name, you know, they call it extra virgin olive oil. Like you're going to marry it, you know, <laughs> like you're winning a bride to make it seem so precious. Uh, <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see what else here. Yeah. And we said whatever, whatever oil you have, they're going to have a detrimental effect on endothelial function. And like, as I told you, I mentioned the Blankenhorn paper as well earlier that it didn't matter what the fat was. They all were atherogenic. Fat is atherogenic. Okay. Green monkey study, fat, atherogenic. Um, no atheroprotective benefit for changing from sat fat to MUFAs. It was as bad as the, uh, the MUFAs, the green monkeys, they've got um, atherosclerosis tendencies very similar to humans. That's why they're studied. Oh, I had a friend, he's an Indian doctor friend of mine, and I hadn't seen him in a couple of months. So I saw him and I go, hey, how you doing? What, what's been going on? And he goes, I, I said, where you been? I haven't seen you. And he goes, I died. I go, what do you mean you died? He goes, I died. And they resuscitated me and they put in some coronary stents. I said, you look so healthy. He's a skinny, healthy looking, energetic guy. I said, I thought you were a vegetarian. He goes, I am. And I'm like, hmm, well, what is it? I go, Maybe it's oil. Do you use oils for cooking? He goes, oh yeah, you have to. And I'm like, no, you don't. So I think it was the oils because that's the only thing I'm aware of for him that's a risk factor. I think that's actually the main problem with the Indian diet is even though a lot of Indians are real healthy, energetic, thin, they're eating too much fried food, many of them. And I think that's why they have an increased tendency to atherosclerosis and diabetes. I talked about that in a previous talk, the whole Tetsumori Yamashima theory of lipid peroxidation and uh, hydroxynonanol predisposing to injury to the beta cells, causing diabetes. So in my, in my diabetes lecture, I went through all that. Um, also in my dementia lecture too. That's that's actually a big theory. I'm going to mention him later in this talk today. Tetsumori Yamashima, Japanese neuroscientist, did a lot of work with omega-6 cooking oils and how atherogenic they are. So I do think olive oil is a little better than these omega-6 cooking oils, but I, but I don't think it's a health food, okay? It might be a luxury thing, but uh, all right. Anyways, what else? Um, increase the clotting factors, number seven. Uh, let's see. So in my opinion, it's detrimental to health, but the omega-6s are worse. Okay, rule of thumb, could Adam and Eve eat it? And if they couldn't, I wouldn't eat it. Okay. Okay, PUFAs, polyunsaturated fats, omega-6s. Now, omega-6s have a terrible reputation. And part of that is deserved in the sense from cooking oils. This right here is Chris Knob. He's a real smart ophthalmologist guy. And he gave a lecture where he researched the epidemiology from multiple different countries, including Japan, China, United States, I think Australia, New Zealand as well too. And his conclusion after studying all this stuff was that the main correlate to the increased obesity uh, in the populations nowadays in these different countries, including the USA, as well as the increase in diabetes was the increased intake of vegetable oils. So these are omega-6 cooking oils. It has to be omega-6 because you can't cook with the omega you know, threes, they're too uh, volatile. They're going to react too soon. They're going to go undergo lipid peroxidation, et cetera. So it's omega-6 cooking oils. And so what I would say though is here we're talking about omega-6 cooking oils, a highly processed uh, thing, these omega-6 oils. They're, they're heated during processing. They're also heated during cooking. And so that is processed, cooked, heated omega-6 oils. But the actual omega-6 fats are super essential for life. 
So the ones you get from plants are actually good. The ones you just get from routine plants, like we talk about on a low-fat vegan diet, and you need those for your mitochondria. We're going to come back to that. So they really ought to, you know, like you say, these are omega-6 cooking oils. And he does call them vegetable oils here. All right. And the other point he'd make out, now this guy, he's a little bit of a fan of eating meat. So he's going to, you know, every speaker is going to have some bias. So he's trying to show you here, look, saturated fat intake has not changed, you know, in all these years, last 80 years. So don't blame it on saturated fats and meat is still good. It's kind of where he's coming from a little bit. Okay. And he also says it's not sugar. Look at the sugar. It doesn't correlate with sugar, the increase in obesity and diabetes. And then there's our, you know, there's other guys out there saying, oh, Fructose is the worst thing in the world. And fructose is, you know, at the root of all health problems. And of course, high fructose corn syrup is much worse thing. The fructose in, in, in fruits is a small thing, but I'm making the point here too, though, and that knob does have a point. When you hear somebody say sugar, you don't know what they're talking about. They're talking about glucose. Are they talking about sucrose? Are they talking about high fructose corn syrup? So be that as it may, I'm just making the point. Omega-6 cooking oils, they are a major issue with making people sick. Okay, now here he is. This is Tetsumori Yamashima. This is one of his books where he wrote about cooking oil and he felt that that was the most important thing, pushing people into becoming demented. And he did a whole bunch of experience. He actually came up with a theory called the calpain cathepsin theory. I went through that before in previous lectures about how the omega-6 cooking oils are predisposing to lipid peroxidation, sort of a toxic chain reaction in fatty acids that are in PUFAs and that these lead to brain damage and they lead to diabetes and um, they also lead to obesity. It's, it's a long story. We don't have time to get into all that, but I'm just reminding you who this guy is, okay? Um, I want you to know about this guy here. This guy is Brian Peskin, and he also has a bias. He sells what are called PEOs. PEOs are parent essential oils. And so he's a big uh, proponent of the idea that what you really want is to have good essential, um, the only essential fats are the C18, that means 18 carbon things, the linoleic acid for omega-6s and the linolenic acid for omega-3s. And so he sells a supplement for those and he calls them parent essential oils. So the key thing is that there's a parent. Those are the ones that are essential. Whereas DHA and EPA, the ones you hear about all the time, those are what he calls derivatives. They're actually not essential. As long as you've got the parent ones, you can make those. We just can't put a double bond at the number three position or the number six position. So that's worth knowing. You actually kind of need to know that to make sense out of stuff. Parent essential oils are the C18 series, you know, either omega-3s or omega-6s, okay? And they're both, you know, an essential part of human health. Okay. Um, okay, now what about science? And people always say, trust the science. What does the research show? But the reality is science in the modern world, so much of it is just industry funded. You know, the, the big sort of more independent funding that used to come out of these big institutions that would fund papers back, you know, before 1980, a lot of that money is all dried up. And so now most money comes from industry and industry, you know, they've got a budget. They're usually not going to fund a paper unless they think it's going to help them to make money. And then the court, you know, the scientists are, you know, poor starving people, you know, PhDs with all these loans and stuff. So they need some work. So the, the, the food company says to them, look, you play ball with us. You make our product look good. We'll give you a grant. You make it look good. We'll give you another grant. And a scientist can become rich if they make uh, one of these big food companies happy, all right? So uh, what I'm saying is that's why I think, you know, uh, you can call it finance, agenda-driven science, finance instead of science. Uh, but unless you do, unless you have high ethics, um, you're not going to have good science. Most science that's done, in my opinion, from looking at medical journals, it's a joke, okay? It's like a bunch of drug advertisements, Um and that's why when somebody says, oh, trust the science, I'm like, well, I need to know who's funding it. There's a lot of things you need to know that are more important than anything else about that paper. Okay. If it's done, funded by an industry, studying their product, you can bet it's not going to be published unless it makes their product look good. All right. Um, that's like their advertising budget is their so-called science research budget. Okay. Why do doctors prescribe fish oil? What they'll tell you, and my internal medicine friends will say this, they go, what well, lowers triglycerides in the blood. And they say it has a mild anticoagulation effect. And those two things can make it cardioprotective. But in the bigger studies, it's not it's been shown to be cardioprotective. Industry will fund tons of studies. It might fund 20 studies, and they'll try to find one that has some cardioprotective effect. They'll try to set it up as a relative risk rather than an absolute risk to try to make their product look good. They're desperate, okay? Um, many people thought it'd be good for the brain and retina, but... It's not 
I personally think it doesn't do much good. I'm not a big fan at all of this fish oil stuff. I think I would not take it to be my feeling about it because I'll explain some of the reasons why um, in the studies. And from what I can read of it, I don't think it's shown a significant effect of benefit. Okay, there's immunosuppression effects. Now that can be useful for treating an autoimmune disease, but that is a, something that you have to factor in when you decide if you want to supplement it with it or not, okay? Um, all oils are obesogenic predisposing a person to have increased risk of gaining weight. Um, Omega-3s also cause increased insulin resistance, so they'll increase your risk of diabetes, all right? There's trade-offs to everything. Um, there's been, I saw three papers showing that they have a negative effect on mitochondrial membranes. I'll explain what that's all about with regard to cardiolipin, okay? So basically, if I had an autoimmune disease, I would first try to fix my leaky gut and see if that would get me healthy. And then I'd try to avoid a few toxic things that can also cause autoimmune disease, and that'll often help a lot of people, but some people don't get better with that. In which case I would then do the next thing I would do. I would do all this omega-3 stuff and try to control it that way. I think that would be a smart thing to do. Um, and I would only then, if that still failed, would I then consider those powerful medications that are almost like chemotherapy, methotrexate and all that stuff. That's what I would do. I'm not, I'm not an autoimmune doctor. I don't take care of autoimmune patients. I'm just giving this psychology. If it was me personally or somebody in my family, that's how I would be thinking. Um, what else? Um, the immunosuppression effect though, they're not even sure why, but omega-3 supplementation, and I think this was especially with the fish oil, but it increased the risk of prostate cancer and they don't know why. Uh, Theodore Brasky was the big researcher with the Hutchinson group. I'll show you some of the papers what that's about, but increased risk of prostate cancer. And that scares me because in general, when I think of prostate cancer, I think of it as being an estrogenic cancer. And I think of anything that's an estrogenic cancer potentially being related to breast cancer. I haven't heard of it being related to breast cancer, but I'm saying is why prostate cancer? Okay. Maybe they just haven't tested it for other cancers. Um, let's see. Fish oil supplements routinely are low in EPA and DHA and contaminated with peroxides. It takes about 17 pounds of fish to make one capsule of fish oil, according to Brian Peskin, the poof expert who I showed you earlier. Um, wow. Yeah, that's a lot. That, yeah. that, that's crazy. Yeah. What they do is they'll take the fish, especially ones they can't sell for other reasons, and they put them like into a blender. They grind them up and they use purification processes to, you know, purify the oil. So it's wow. not, that's what he said in his book. So, you know. Okay. Um, and they're, you know, the way fish is cooked, it's often fried on nonstick cookware. You know, I, I really think fish is not too healthy. There was an interesting book written by a, a lady internal medicine doctor in the San Francisco Bay area. Her name was Hightower. I think it was Jane Hightower. Uh, I'm not sure on the first name, but I know the book. I read the book a couple of times. And what she found is there are all these yuppies becoming demented in their forties and fifties and nobody knew what to do with them. They're getting bounced around from doctor to doctor, demented patient. We don't know why. And she figured out how to more accurately test the mercury levels in their blood. And it was from eating fish. So they were a bunch of, you know, yuppies trying to be healthy and they're making themselves <laughs> demented. And a lot of them, you know, recovered once they, they got them off the fish. Not all of them recovered though. Um, Let's see. So yeah, that's, that's another reason why I wouldn't eat fish and I would be concerned. How well is the stuff purified? Is the fish oil, you know, capsule going to have that in there? I would get the plant-based one if I was ever going to take it. Okay. There's other things in fish, PCBs, EDCs, all that stuff. Okay. So here was just a study of fish oil supplements. This is the one done in New Zealand, but what they said is many of them were highly oxidized, meaning they had undergone like lipid peroxidation reactions. They were full of contaminants. They were not healthy oils. You wouldn't want them. And many of them also, they didn't meet the specifications on the label, okay? They would not have what they were supposed to have. They claimed to have for DHA and EPA. Most products tested, 69% of them contain less than 67% of what they claimed to uh, contain. Uh, the majority exceeded the recommended indices for oxidative, um, you know, harmful uh, byproducts being present and whether or not it was best before day, the cost, the country of origin, exclusivity, none of these were markers <laughs> were useful to tell you if you're getting good stuff. So the fish oil supplements really don't look good. Um, yes, they can decrease triglycerides in your blood, but you know, that beneficial effect is counteracted by other problems. They increase your insulin resistance. They make you fat. So eventually your lipids are going to come back up. They're prothrombotic in the sense with factor seven, even though I know they're slightly anti-thrombotic. Like I said, we never paid any attention if the patient was on fish oil. We could care less when we were doing procedures. I don't care what the case was. We didn't even pay any attention to it. And it never, I never once had a bleed or a problem because of fish oil, okay? So it's a pretty minor anti-thrombotic effect. 
Okay, um, dietary omega-3s and fish consumption, risk of diabetes. The marine ones were worse than the plant-based omega-3s and they increased um, the incidence and the risk of type 2 diabetes. Increased risk of type 2 diabetes with intake of long chain omega-3 fatty acids, especially with the higher intakes, okay? Um, and the marine, but the not plant-based. So yeah, it was definitely worse with the, the fish ones rather than the plant-based ones. Because, you know, with the fish, there's a lot of other bad things happening too. Fish have a lot of saturated fat, plus they got a lot of estrogenic chemicals. So the plant ones are definitely significantly better. Okay, this is just some ways to remember the names of these things. You can remember linoleic acid right here is just LA. Um, and that's nice because it has two double bonds. So LA with two double bonds. And, and like I said, you need to know this one because this is the PEO, the parent essential oil, the essential one. So this right here is an essential oil. There's only two of them, linoleic acid here and then ALA, alpha linolenic acid. There's a little N in the second part of the name. And so that's how you say it different. This has no N there. All right, and then you can remember it has three letters, ALA, and that is the omega-3 essential uh, fatty acid. These are the only two essential fatty acids. All right, and then because it has an extra double bond there, it does have increased risk of lipid peroxidation compared with LA. All right. And then everybody's sort of been conditioned to think, oh, the omega threes are so great, anti inflammatory. Oh, the omega sixes are so bad, inflammatory. But in reality, we really need these omega sixes. We just don't need them from a cooking oil. When we get them from eating plants, for the most part, they do a lot of very good things for us. They're the, they're the key thing to make your mitochondrial work. Okay. It's just the cooking oils that are bad because they're so processed and that damages the oils. Okay. Um, the other ones you're going to hear about a lot, you're going to hear a lot about arachidonic acid, and that is a, you know, a derivative of the omega-6s, okay? And that one has four double bonds. Um, then you're going to hear about these two, EPA and DHA. So EPA has five double bonds, and DHA has six double bonds. That's a lot of double bonds. And that's why it kind of scares me, this idea. I go, are you crazy? You want to take uh, something with six double bonds there? That's going to go undergo lipid peroxidation so fast it's not even funny. Okay, so here's, I've drawn out the chemical structures in a little more detail. This is the C18 series. So C18 means 18 carbons. And so the saturated fat version one is called steric acid. So you see there's no double bonds on here. And that's going to have a relatively high melting point. Okay, the more double bonds you have, the more fragile it is, the more readily at a lower temperature it'll melt. Okay, and, and the, the point of it all too is if you get to the, the C18 with the three double bonds, you, you and then you go to DHA and stuff, those will stay liquid even in super cold water, about almost freezing cold water. And that's why cold water fish will have these things, okay? But, you know, we don't live in that cold of a water, okay? We're not the same as a fish. Um, so here's C18-2, again, same thing we just talked about, the omega-6, linoleic acid, all right? Um, and that, like I said, the derivative of that is arachidonic acid. Um, the derivative of ALA is EPA and DHA, okay? And I just highlighted that the five and the six mean EPA five double bonds, DHA six double bonds. That's a highly relevant point because that means they're more prone to um, lipid peroxidation. Okay, so, you know, Dr. McDougall's famous quote from him is the fat you eat is the fat you wear. And he also, you'll hear him talking about how when a person eats a certain type of dietary fat, whatever type of fat it is, if you subsequently go up to them and you do a biopsy out of part of their body, you know, take it out of their gluteus or their other part of their body, you'll see a distribution, a relative amount of fatty acid types similar to what they eat from their diet. And the point of that is our gut pretty much absorbs fatty acids for the most part intact. You think about it, it's a good energy source. You can absorb a glucose, one glucose at a time. You can then absorb also a fatty acid, whole big fatty acid at a time. And that enables us to get all the energy out. That wouldn't make sense to break it up into individual carbons because the way we get energy from it is breaking those carbon-carbon uh, bonds, okay? So that's why we absorb the whole thing in bulk, but that's also why what we eat, the types of fatty acids we eat, affect the types of fatty acids subsequently that become located in our cell membranes, including our mitochondrial membranes. And that's a big point, including our mitochondrial membranes, okay? Um, Let's see. So this is just another study saying here, you know, what the mouse was eating is what showed up in their tissues when they when they biopsy them. OK. And so I became very interested in what how does oxygen get across the um, the cell wall? Because oxygen has to cross a lot of membranes. You breathe it in. It has to go from your you know trachea, your respiratory tract. It has to then 
go across the, the membrane of your epithelium lining, your respiratory tract. It has to then go into a red blood cell, bind to hemoglobin, reach the tissues where it's going to be delivered, exit the red blood cell, go through the red blood cell membrane, go to the endothelial membrane, and then go into the tissue. And so what I'm saying is, how does oxygen do that? And when I was a medical student, we would just learn it diffuses, that it's relatively non-charged and it's a small molecule, can just pass through membrane by diffusion. And I thought, well, gee, that's interesting. And then I read Brian Peskin papers, and he said the omega-6s are the most important thing is what his research had showed, his study of the literature and whatnot. But then I read a more recent paper. This paper right here, so this is an interesting paper, Role of Channels in the Oxygen Permeability of Red Blood Cells. And what this group came to the conclusion was that probably 90% or more of oxygen is traveling through uh, carrier proteins, including like aquaporin, which we typically think of as transmitting water, and also the rhesus proteins, which we typically think of as being related to the antigens, you know, the immune profile of a red blood cell. But there's another type too, where they haven't discovered the name of it. So this is a big paradigm shift because if Peskin had been right, and I actually think Peskin was, you know, did some useful work, but I don't think he was fully right in the sense that he thought that it was primarily just on the omega-6 fats that oxygen was interacting with that methylene bridge carbon reversibly and then passing, you know, sort of bouncing into that and then bouncing across the rest of the way into the cell cytoplasm. And so what they're saying is, ah, it's mostly these carrier proteins and we don't even know the last 10% if it really is omega-6 or not. Because if that had been true, then that would make you think, well, gee, I should probably eat more uh, raw food. But it does it's not the case. So... So I don't think raw food is going to matter for that. Okay, that's where I'm at on that. I haven't fully figured this all out. There's not a lot of papers. And this I thought was interesting too. How oxygen gets across the membrane of a cell is like super important. On a scale of one to 10, that's 10 out of 10 important. But hardly any research. You could barely find a paper on this. I spent a couple of days trying to figure this out. And it's so hard to figure out because no one cares. No one cares about it because no one can make money off it. And that's what I meant by our research is kind of a joke because no one's studying the most important things. Everybody's just trying to win the lottery, sell our supplement, you know, sell our food product, sell our drug. And hardly anybody's saying, you know, how does this work? That's what really matters. Um, once you figure that out, then you can do a lot of other good things. But sad to say, there's no money in figuring out the most important things. So again, this is just the idea of simple diffusion, the blue circle being oxygen from a red blood cell passing through the plasma membrane and, you know, just by diffusion, being uncharged and small, being able to then travel through membranes, get to the mitochondria. Okay, great. Then here's what Brian Peskin thought based on the old literature. And based on the old literature, he was correct that it seemed to be what was happening was the oxygen was interacting with the omega-6 fats with their methylene bridge uh, carbons irreversibly and then working their way across the membrane in that fashion. Okay. But then in these more recent papers are shown that it was primarily going through these carrier proteins and in which case then the, the fatty acid composition is not as important for oxygen getting across the membrane, okay? Certainly, it's not good if you have a thickened basement membrane here because of diabetes and hypertension, but still, the point is made that it's not the amino, it's not the fatty acid composition so much that's affecting oxygen uh, according to these more recent papers. So we've got the technology to research this. We ought to be studying it. That's a super important thing. You could potentially dramatically improve sports performance. You could potentially, you know, really help uh, prevent cancer and treat cancer patients by understanding that. And nobody's studying it. Okay. Um, I searched that, you know, 20 different ways trying to figure that out because uh, it's so important. And, and those like, I couldn't find the papers. All right, so anyways, here's what lipid peroxidation is all about. We talked about having the double bond here and then the skip carbon right here being the methylene bridge carbon. There's the vulnerable hydrogen on there and that hydrogen can be plucked off, leaving a free electron unbound to anything else in the outer orbital. And that's called a free radical and oxygen really goes after that. Forms of peroxide, we have two oxygen in a row bound to each other. And this itself is a free radical with an unpaired electron in the outer orbital. And so anyways, this is lipid peroxidation. This is a lipid of fat. And this is a peroxide, peroxide formation of it with oxygen. And so what I'm saying is omega-3s, especially DHA and EPA with all their double bonds are super, super vulnerable to this. That's why I, I would not be too enthusiastic about them uh, unless one was pretty careful. I kind of like that ALA better. That's a safer molecule. Okay, but you know there are different contexts for this. And okay, I'm just, I'm just helping you understand what the issues are. All right, and you can then have a whole chain reaction. Uh, once this lipid peroxide goes, it'll then react with the, the lipid next to it, especially if it's a PUFA. Okay, now here's cardiolipin, and cardiolipin is a fascinating uh, phospholipid. It's very unique. 
And it especially lives in the mitochondria, especially in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay, it can be present a little bit in some other spots, but it is primarily a, a mitochondrial phospholipid. And it's like this giant monster of a phospholipid. A typical phospholipids is like less than half of cardiolipin. You typically, we just showed one earlier where you'll have the three carbons of a glycerol. A glycerol is kind of like a propane triol, you know, three carbons with three oxygen, three alcohol groups on it. But anyways, so the first one's bound to a fatty acid and in cardiolipin, all of the fatty acids typically are linoleic acid, meaning C18 with two double bonds. Okay, our essential omega-6 fatty acid. This is what I meant by the omega-6s you get from fats. They actually are super important. They're more important than the omega-3s. About a, There's about 11 times more omega-6 linoleic acid in your body than there is omega-3s, okay? And they make up your major energy-related phospholipid in your mitochondria, all right? And these phospholipids, they bind to these proton pumping complexes, and they're part of the structure and the stabilization of uh, your mitochondrial electron transport chain. This is super important. And the problem is with some of these supplementation routines, you could potentially displace when, you, when you're given DHA, you know, from fish oil, you could, be, it seems that you're displacing these um, linoleic acid uh, fatty tails, and that that's doing damage to mitochondria. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Okay. Cardiolipin, peroxyl radicals, lipid peroxidation, and mitochondrial dysfunction and aging. Okay. So IMM is intermitochondrial membrane is very vulnerable to lipid peroxidation of the cardiolipin because that's where you generate reactive oxygens. Okay. Just generating a few little superoxides. People have described that as being like the pilot light in a heater and a stove, you know, um, and a little bit is normal, but when you start generating a lot of them because you're eating high dietary fat or you're ingesting mitochondria inhibitors, uh, you'll start having so many of these uh, reactive oxygens in your mitochondria that you're damaging these cardiolipins. And that's a big deal because then you're really damaging the mitochondria. Okay, so what are some papers here? Incorporation of marine lipids into mitochondrial membranes cause an increased susceptibility to damage by calcium and by reactive oxygen species. So this is what I was talking about. If you're eating these fish oils, you're increasing your risk of having damage to your mitochondria, okay? So I think that's a pretty big deal. That's why I would never take fish oils. Um, that's why I, I don't eat fish for multiple reasons either. I recommend zero fish and I don't, I don't, I wouldn't take any fish oil. Um, like I said, if I had an autoimmune disease, I would consider, you know, the algae stuff, but I wouldn't take fish oil. Okay, lower uh, cardiac mitochondrial enzyme activity, replacing linoleic acid. Okay, so when you use DHA, it was replacing some of the cardiolipin uh, linoleic acids. And that was causing decreased mitochondrial function. And I think what's happening is the cardiolipin structure is designed to primarily work with linoleic acid. And like I said, it's part of the structure of the mitochondria binding to the, the proton pumping complexes, you know, like complexes one, three, four, and five. Uh, here it is. Okay. And so when those don't function as well, your mitochondria doesn't function as well. You can't make as much energy and that ends up being a big deal. So it's a sense in a sense being like a mitochondrial inhibitor because you need your mitochondria to make lots of ATP in your brain cells to pump out calcium from your cytoplasm. So that's why, you know, when you, it's best to like obey mother nature. What does mother nature want me to do? She wants me to eat plant foods. Okay. I'll do it. Okay. Uh, she doesn't necessarily want you to grind up 17 fish to make a fish oil capsule. That's not exactly following mother nature. Um, this is just showing cardiolipin also binds to cytochrome C. And so when you damage these cardiolipins, it'll potentially lose its uh, binding to cytochrome C. And that can activate the whole apoptosis uh, protocol in a mitochondria. Because cells, you know, they'll have a tendency to die. If they lose too many of their mitochondria, they can't make energy. They'll just die. And they'd rather go into apoptosis, a gradual program cell death, where they can recycle some of their other chemical constituents than to just go into frank necrosis where the cell just dies suddenly, its plasma membrane opens up in lysis, its contents are released in the extracellular matrix, and it's all a waste, a big mess, big inflammatory mess. Versus apoptosis is a gradual cell death. The cell says, we are not able to make enough mito uh, ATP to meet our energy needs. We have to go into apoptosis. Let's gradually recycle what we've got. And then the macrophages will come in and like the microglia in the brain, and they'll absorb those chemical constituents and be able to send them to other parts of the body and still get some use out of them. And that's why you don't see apoptosis on a, on a brain MRI because the cells are recycled rather than destroyed abruptly like with a stroke where you can just point to the stroke because the plasma membrane lyses and spills everything out versus apoptosis, it's all just gradually recycled. Okay, so anyways, here's what DHA looks like. I drew a molecule of DHA. Docosa means 22 because there's 22 carbons. Hexa means six for six double bonds. Um, they're all cis type double bonds. Um, 
And then the ick is just carboxylic acid. And the point is, when you got six double bonds, you got a lot of these methyl methylene bridge carbons. I drew them in pink here. And those are all the targets for lipid peroxidation. So something with this many double bonds is very vulnerable to lipid peroxidation. So it's not a very stable molecule. And even if you're putting it in the fridge in a rate opaque container, you still got to be careful with it. And, you know, it can oxidize pretty fast. You know, it'll oxidize at room temperature, yet alone when your body 98.6. Okay, um, let's see, let's see. Oh, this is just talking about lipid peroxidase and membranes and all the problems that can cause. This was a paper showing oxidation of omega-3s and omega-6 fatty acids like from fish oil and how they're, they're very prone to oxidation. Like I said, you, you better be careful how you store them. And even then, you know, it's not as easy as one thinks. When you eat them out of nature in a plant, the plants kelp them in their, their, their native appropriate phase. Let's say within the plant, your omega-6 uh, PEOs, parent essential oils of linoleic acid, linolenic acid. So the plant is keeping it the way you want. That's what nature made, how you're supposed to get it. It's what your gut's designed to get it from. Okay, association between omega-3 fat and, cup and cardiovascular events. So here's a paper in JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association. In general, when these well-known journals talk about something, they're usually going to praise the drug or the supplement. They're potentially going to get a lot of advertising money from it. Omega-3 is one of the, the most popular supplements, okay? Um, so uh, for them to say it doesn't work, negative papers should be taken more seriously than positive papers because most of the stuff that gets published is positive because it's funded by industry and they want to make money. And here they said omega-3 supplementation was not, that's an important word, they're not associated with a lower risk of all-cause mortality. It was not associated with decreasing the risk of cardiac death or sudden death or myocardial infarction. That's a heart attack or of a stroke based on both relative and absolute measures. And absolute measures are more important, absolute risk, okay? It's also good to know the number needed to treat. But anyways, this is a lot of patients, 68,000 patients, okay? And so for JAMA to come out and say it doesn't work for cardiac protection, that's a big deal, okay? Because why are those internal medicine doctors thinking that they should prescribe it? Because they think it's cardioprotective, but it's not, okay? So like I said, I would not take fish oil. All right, here's a bunch of other papers on fish oil. Is it cardioprotective? These are all, you know, indicating that that does not appear to be cardioprotective. And you might hear, oh, well, I heard on one paper it was cardioprotective. But like I said, the industry will run 20 papers and then they'll just try to take the one that it showed some small benefit and then they'll claim it's beneficial. Um, so I don't think it's cardioprotective. Okay, then what about the cancer risk? This is the guy who did the most work on it. The best, you know, expert out there on this subject is Theodore Brasky. And here's one of his papers on plasma phospholipid fatty acids and prostate cancer risk in the select trial. And then they did follow-up papers to confirm that increased the risk of that. The fish oil also was associated increasing the risk of colon cancer metastases in the rat liver. And why would it do this? Because your immune system protects you, not just from infections, it protects you from cancer, okay? A cancer cell will, a cancer tumor in an organ, let's say in the liver, it's gonna shed some cells into the blood and it's the immune system that removes those, okay? So you want a good functioning immune system to remove metastatic cancer cells because they travel through the blood to go to another location. That's what metastasis means, to travel to another location. It can also travel through lymphatics, but that's how it happens. Here's another paper showing increased incidence of colon cancer and metastases in rats uh, when they had the uh, omega-3. So uh, the fish oil made it worse. So that's one thing you gotta be careful about immune suppression. Here's one of Brasky's paper. He did several showing an increased risk of cancer with fish oil. So increased EPA and DHA in the blood were associated with increased prostate cancer. Okay, and that's relevant too, because some people are going to tell you, oh, you have to check your EPA, DHA in the blood, and if they're low, you need to, you need to supplement like with fish oil, for example. And I would, I would not do that. I would be worried about immunosuppressant increasing my risk of prostate cancer, you know? Prostate uh, biopsy is no fun. 12 big needles up your butt, okay? Sextant biopsy, a bunch of core specimens can potentially make you impotent. I don't want that. Um, and here he said, Theodore Brasky, the consistency of these findings suggests that the fatty acids are involved in prostate tumorigenesis, okay? And recommendations to increase uh, omega-3 PUFA levels should be, take this into consideration, okay? Theodore Brasky, if you want to look him up, he's written several papers on the subject. He's sort of like a world-famous expert on that. Okay, influence of lipid diets on the number of metastases, okay? And this was another thing showing that increased omega-3s um, increase the risk of metastatic cancer. Okay. So I don't like that. Um, DHA supplementation um, and cognitive decline that 
these studies show that it was not uh, neuroprotective. And I don't see a mechanism whereby it would be protective. Okay, this one was with 400 patients. I am aware that there have been some papers. I'm aware there was some paper with like 64, 65 females done by some Chinese research suggesting that it did have a benefit. But I would say from my study of the literature, it primarily does not. Okay. Um, and some people are going to say, oh, you need to take it. Or I don't, I don't think the literature supports that. I would not take uh, omega-3s for cognitive protection. I don't think it's going to. Something that increases your risk of diabetes and obesity, um, I don't think it's going to lower your risk of dementia. Okay. And then there's also something that's been called the hype and a bust cycle. And I heard this guy, Jeff Nelson, talking about this, the hype and a bust cycle that industry research, he said, puts like a health halo around certain things that it's going to sell. And you'll notice that these things get hyped initially and everybody's like, oh yeah, I got to get on the bandwagon. I got to get this new supplement that makes everybody healthy. And then over time, it starts coming out that, well, gee, maybe it's not so healthy. It's, it's probably just a waste of time. And then more time goes by and it's shown that it's bad for you. So I joke, like I say, I don't think caffeine is a good idea because it does all these things I don't want. It's an excitotoxin. It decreases blood flow to the brain while some simultaneously increasing metabolic rate because it increases glutamate release in your neurons of your brain, okay? It's an excitatory neurotransmitter increasing the metabolic rate of neurons, but it's a vasoconstrictor lowering your oxygen glucose delivery to your brain. Plus it causes insomnia, which is bad for the brain. So I think caffeine, coffee, and tea are quite overrated. That's my opinion based on some extensive study of it. So as far as nuts, I think nuts, you know, it's, it's a relatively safe delivery mechanism for fats. You avoid all the problems with animal fats, but I, I do think nuts are overrated. Um, so you can say they're a tasty food and there's really not a lot of bad stuff about them, but they're still, you know, 70 to 90% fat. Okay. And so what I'm saying is that I drew this in a sense, like this health halo, if you will, then becoming a green halo and then becoming, I drew it orange, like, like, like the leaves in the autumn. Okay. And then also like combusting and becoming like a fire and dis and dis a discontinuous line uh, once the, the industry hype sort of faded off, okay? And then I drew down here like devil horns on like, like Florida. When that first went into the water, everybody's like, oh, it's great. We got to have that save our teeth, et cetera. But now the times come out, they say it lowers IQ and increases risk of cancer. It's not a good thing, okay? Omega-6 cooking oils, everybody thought they were the great thing going to save you in the 1960s. After Ansel Keys had shown in the 1950s that saturated fat was markedly increasing atherosclerosis, coronary artery disease risk. Uh, but then it, the research more and more as it got done, the omega-6 fats has shown that this is like the cooking oils. No, they're not a health food. They're actually highly toxic, okay? So that is the hype and bust cycle of, um, of a lot of these supplements. And here's just another paper showing the uh, autoimmune, the immune suppressive effects of omega-3 uh, uh, fats, okay? Uh, so I'm, I'm just making the point. This is something that's well known. This is not like some fringe thing. It's well known. All right. Now who recommends that you avoid fish oil? You know, Dr. McDougall, you know, has studied this and he talks about it in a start solution. Here's the page number 123. If we eat natural plant foods, we will always during all stages of our life, get enough DHA and other omega-3 fats. So I would say too, the point is from that linolenic acid, the only one that's essential, ALA, alpha linolenic acid, you then make whatever, EPA and DHA that you need. And you don't need to make much of it. Actually, Brian Peskin pointed out that hardly any of the of the PEO, ALA, um, you know, omega-3 precursor, parent essential oil, gets converted to DHA. He says it's, you know, in the ballpark, at most 5%, probably more like 1%. It's a minimal amount, all right? Uh, so you don't need to, he says, he thinks that people taking these big supplements of fish oil with lots and lots of DHA and EPA in his opinion, you're they're overdosing on EPA and DHA, okay? 20 to 500 fold. And like I said, I'd be worried about that being toxic to the mitochondria. I'd be worried about that undergoing lipid peroxidation. And then, you know, he felt that that could potentially deplete a person's antioxidants dealing with all the lipid peroxidation related to those unnecessary uh, fats in the blood. That's his theory. And he's a biased guy. Peskin's biased. I mean, he sells PEO supplements. And it was funny too. He wrote his book with a co-author named Rowan, R-O-W-E-M. And what was funny was the Rowan guy was a was a vegetarian vegan. And he basically said, I get all my PEOs from eating plant foods. So I don't need to take the supplement. But most people aren't willing to do that. So they should take a supplement. But I would just say, well, why not do what he does? Just eat your plant foods. You'll get them. Okay. Um, let's see what else on here. Oh, these are some interesting studies. Nathan Pritikin had done a pretty extensive study of uh, lipids in diets. He basically said, Nathan Pritikin, I think it's a good statement. There's two main types of diets. There's either high-fat diets or low-fat diets. 
And he also said, there's no such thing as being deficient in fats. It's impossible with any naturally chosen diet to be deficient in fats. Uh, his opinion was that he looked at some studies, this one done by Winnitz in 1970. These references all came from his book. Okay, here's the rest of the reference here. For six months, the patients were fed only 0.7% fat. That is less than 1% fat, primarily this linoleic acid, the omega-6 precursor, because our body needs that far more than it needs omega-3s. Like I said, all our mitochondria are dependent on that. And there were no adverse effects, okay? Um, so that's my point. People were doing well on less than 1% fat. It's an extraordinary low amount of fat, but it makes sense too. You think about it, white rice is about 1% fat. Same thing with potatoes and sweet potatoes. And we know that people can do very well when the vast majority of their calories are from those foods. Okay, here's McKean did a study with controlled diets where they also were eating only 0.7% fat. I think it was similar to the Winnett's uh, study. This was also done around the same time. And those patients also did very well and the, and the children grew well and developed well. So again, we don't really need much fat. Uh, let's see. Okay, um, and then people start getting into these evolutionary arguments. They'll say, they'll say, oh, we need to eat fish. All our ancestors did. No, they didn't. Lots of our ancestors lived inward on continents and probably didn't need hardly any fish, if any at all. And then there's the other evolutionary argument. Well, did we evolve from chimps or some other chimp-like ancestor? And the thing that's funny about that is chimps don't eat fish and gorillas don't eat fish either. I mean, they're almost vegans. I mean, chimps will eat a little bit of meat. They'll actually chase other monkeys and eat other monkeys. Um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, vegans get enough omega-3s. We talked about the cardiolipins. Okay. Uh, no, this is one of those papers showing you get enough of all of them all through your life just eating plant foods. All right. Oh, I tried to make this, these things line up. They didn't line up the way I wanted them. All right. Well, anyway, here was the point on this slide is that you get enough omega-6 just from eating plant foods. They've got enough in there. You don't need much and you get what you need from eating plant foods. You know, all these blue zone like populations, they don't go around looking for omega-3 supplements or omega-6 supplements. Um, we get adequate amounts from plants. Uh, according to Pritikin, you just eat one bowl of oatmeal a day and just one little bowl, 100 grams. He says, that'll give you all the omega-6 you need. Um, Let's see. Oh, yeah. And also the fish. Where do the fish get their omega-3s from? From eating the plants. It's the plant that makes it. It's not the animal that makes it. And it's the best packaging is that it comes from uh, it comes from the plant food. That way, it's not lipid peroxidized by the time you eat it. Versus if you got some supplements sitting on a shelf for who knows how long in the store, in the warehouse, you know, in your house before you eat it, you know, that's sitting around a lot, sort of unprotected, if you will, more at risk. Um, to become lipid peroxidized, oxidized. And then the one thing I kind of joke about is there's different theories of how humans arose. The most common theory is that all humans arose out of Africa. There's another theory that humans arose initially in Europe, went back to Africa. I don't know for sure what happened. If you look at the old watering hole, you know, kind of like the modern gas station, um, when the animals go there to drink, you know, if it's all from Africa, that's pretty hot. Okay, these are not cold water fish. So they really wouldn't want too much <laughs> DH3 and be at risk to have that lipid peroxidized. Okay. Um, all right. Then I was going to make some jokes about, uh, you know, are we really like chimps? Because they'll all tell you, oh, we're so much like chimps, only 1% or 5% DNA difference BS. You can, you can say we're more like another animal or not based on a, a small part of the coding DNA. But if you look at the totality of our DNA and all the regulatory DNA, we are very different than chimps. Okay. You know, you look at these two fraternal twins, they're like 95% like each other, 90% like each other, okay? The twin, the chimp is not like us, okay? Jane Goodall, you know, you look at Jane Goodall and you have a different thought in your mind than you look at this chimp, okay? It looks like a giant spider, all right? It's kind of scary looking, okay? And then why do women have bigger butts than men relative to their, their, their waist? And the reason is they carry omega-3s there. And omega-3s are important for the baby's um, uh, brain development. They are part of brain development. They do do some good things, okay? But once you've got them, you know, we can still remember stuff from our childhood because neurons don't turn over that much, okay? And, and I said in a woman, it's almost like a peacock display. If her hips areas are wider than her waist, that's an indicator that she's likely to be fertile. And a man pays attention to it. They can't even help it, okay? You just see a woman, you notice that immediately. And I think it's because to approach a woman in a romantic way is dangerous, okay? She might freak out on you. Her brother will beat you up. Her father will beat you up. Her boyfriend will beat you up. Her husband will beat you up. So you don't even remotely consider 
reproaching her in a romantic way unless you're thinking maybe we can make a baby or your subconscious mind trains you to do that because the big challenge to humans is can we survive get enough food to eat and can we reproduce okay we're sort of like and we're partly divine i believe creating the image of god but we're also partly beast and what i'm saying is that's a peacock display okay and that's why i think women are shaped that way okay and it's just the way it is and we can't help it it's like biologically programmed you don't need to read a book about it it's just something that happens in your brain when you see a woman you, you notice that Okay, um, let's see, what else? This is more papers along the things we just talked about. Okay, now we're gonna talk about nuts, all right? And people get kind of jumpy when I start talking about nuts. And I can tell you, this Jeff Nelson guy at VegSource, he did like seven videos, some of them like an hour long on nuts. He's real obsessive, compulsive, went into every detail, probably more than anyone wants to go into, but he did a very thorough, extensive, careful study of it, okay? And the gist of it is they taste good, if you want to enjoy them, fine, if you can handle the fat, but they are going to increase your risk of weight gain. They are full of fat. They don't have any significant protective effect versus heart disease. You can always do a straw man competition where you compare something to, you know, if you, and the other thing about nut eaters, they're kind of like those yuppie fish eaters. People who are thinking about nuts tend to be more health aware. Somebody who's more likely to exercise, to think about their health. And if you set up a study, where you buy somebody who's otherwise healthy, they can eat almost anything and it'll still come out making the food look good rather than the food itself. The more you control for those types of effects, the less of a benefit you can show with nuts. Um, and what he also pointed out is if, if nuts were so great or if omega-3s were so great uh, from fish oil, you would just do like a randomized control trial, kind of like what you know Ornish did to show the benefits of the vegetarian diet for cardiac protection and just prove it. But they don't do that because they can't, okay? They would if they could. These food companies have billion dollar budgets. They've got the money to fund whatever they want, okay? All right, oh, what improves blood flow? So basically, low fat diet improves blood flow, being warm, and the reason I'm just going to briefly talk about blood flow is everything in your body functions better with good blood flow. Any wound you want to heal, any disease you want to reverse, having good blood flow helps to reverse that. Okay, um, being warm, getting your sunshine. Okay, uh, eating a low-fat diet, we talked about low sodium. Plants contain the vasodilators, potassium, magnesium, the nitrate precursors from the greens, you know, the whole, you know, nitrate to nitric oxide precursor pathway. Low sodium, because sodium is an inhibitor of endothelial nitric oxide. That's why you don't want it. Being well hydrated, that also improves blood flow a bit. Uh, keep moving. You know, all those blue zone populations, the people are active. They're not necessarily going to health club, but they're doing some type of movement, uh, keeping busy all day. Avoid caffeine, vasoconstrictor, increases stress. So stress uh, uh, worsens blood flow. All right, things that help avoid stress is getting your sleep. Getting asleep, I know it's super important. Like I track my ability to lift weights and I'm way stronger when I've had a nap or I had a good sleep the night before. And it just makes you more healthy. I also know if I don't get a good night's sleep before, I start dozing off or almost taking miniature naps uh, when I'm trying to work. So it's not good. Sleep is super important. The brain cleans itself during sleep. Uh, we really heal a lot during sleep. Joyful music. It just makes us happy. And they've shown, I'll show you the, some of the papers, that person's uh, blood flows better um, when, when they're listening to pleasant music, when they're laughter. So if they're watching a comedy, if they're with a friend and they can joke with each other, that sort of happiness, you know, it um, lowers our stress level, improves our blood flow, improves our improves our tissue perfusion. You know, being around positive people, positive relationships, they have a therapeutic beneficial effect on us. Um, having a sense of purpose in your life, for a lot of people, religion helps that as well. Okay, things that worsen blood flow, um, eating real high fat meals. And now they tested this with nuts, like in these pulse wave velocity things. And it was a relatively minimal negative effect. It wasn't that strong. So I think nuts are a relatively healthy fat delivery system, but it's still fat. Okay. Um, problems with excessive high fructose corn syrup. That's bad. Excessive simple sugars. It's going to raise all your triglycerides and cause problems just related to that. I previously talked, I think one of my recent lectures about high fructose corn syrup in some detail. Okay. The sodium is a problem being stressed out. So you want to avoid people that are really negative, really negative social interactions and you can't change people. So you want to just try to avoid a person who's really negative is usually the best way to go about that. Make sure you're getting your sleep. Sleep deprivation just raises the same hormones as psychological stress. Caffeine does the same thing, elevates cortisol and the catecholamines. That's adrenaline and noradrenaline. Same thing as epinephrine and norepinephrine. Okay, uh, things that diminish nitric oxide. Um, lack of plants means you're gonna be potentially low in your potassium and magnesium. They're both vasodilators. Having something that's cold. If you wanna heal your foot, for example, you wanna keep it warm. Uh, smoking tobacco is a vasoconstrictor problem. 
uh, anything prothrombotic, like things that cause leaky gut, they let those LPS um, and LTA, the, the bacterial endotoxins into the blood, those are prothrombotic, okay? So you, they even call this postprandial endotoxemia. So animal food diets tend to be high in fats, high in bacteria, and low in fiber, and so they predispose to leaky gut. Um, eventually becoming iron overloaded can also contribute to this whole process of redox cycling and can end up being prothrombotic. That's kind of a topic for another day, but um, reactivation of dormant bacteria, all that stuff, but that's all bad. Uh, that's why I try not to be iron overloaded. Okay, anyways, those are things that increase blood flow, uh, improve blood flow. Let's see, so high fat intake impairs recovery of endothelial cells. And this was done in young people. After they ate a high fat meal, it was harder for them to recover from a stressful event. You know, they gave them some stressful academic thing. Um, here's a acute effect of singing. So just something a person enjoys. If they like singing, like and they like singing with their pleasant music, they'll get a vasodilatory effect from that, okay? Um, here's one showing the differential effects. This guy, Robert Vogel, is pretty famous. He did a whole bunch of research with, you know, the brachial artery reactivity test. You put a blood pressure cuff up. You can constrict down a segment and then release it. How fast does the artery recover its blood flow? And he did a whole bunch of research papers uh, on these topics. Okay, so basically, listening to joyful music improved blood flow. Here it is, improved blood flow. Listening to sort of like negative music, anxiety-provoking music would either have a, a neutral effect, no effect, or it would have a negative effect on blood flow. Okay, so that's why, because I know sometimes too, I'll be, sometimes I'll be working with some friends, okay? And uh, we'll have to do some work, you know, this could be, you know, medical work too. And if we hear music in the background that we enjoy, pleasant, uplifting music, um, we just feel better, okay? And I know that it's having these types of effects. And you also know too, somebody you like walks into the room, you're happy, just puts you in a good mood. It's all good, okay? And it lowers your stress and improves blood flow. So Try to spend as much of the time as you can in your life around these positive, pleasant things. It's good for you. It's not just enjoyable for the moment. It's actually good for you as well. Okay, is it nutty to eat nuts? Um, let's see. Oh, they do increase oxalates a little bit, but I think that whole oxalate thing is exaggerated. But elevated oxalates can increase your risk of kidney stones. One thing I'd be a little concerned about nuts is, you know, these high-fat foods in general will have increased dietary AGEs, advanced glycation end products, Okay. I'll show a slide to that effect. Fat in general, though, it increases the risk of diabetes, hypertension, and becoming fatter. But I think if you have to have fat, nuts is about the best place to get fats from. But I don't seek it out. I don't eat nuts at all, by the way. I'm kind of like my version of, you know, my version of the low-fat diet. I call it the Spartan vegan diet. It's very similar to the Esselstyn diet, you know. I don't have any oil, none, zero, nuts, none, zero. But if if it was a holiday and let's say some old friend insisted I have one, yeah, I would have one, okay? But I don't ever eat them normally. The whole year will go by, I don't ever eat them. I used to take Brazil nuts for selenium, but then I realized I, I get plenty of selenium from the other foods that I ate, so I stopped taking Brazil nuts. They're super high fat, 89% fat. Okay, glycation damage, a possible hub for major pathological uh, disorders in aging. So that's what I meant by meat, oil, and nuts. They all got a lot of AGEs. I'm going to show you. I had this paper, okay, that's, that talks all about the amount of AGEs from nuts. Okay, so here's the paper if you're interested. But then it wouldn't display because some of my slides get distorted because I got to change computers to give these talks here to, to go on the Zoom so anyway, here's what I wanted to make. So like here's fried bacon, 12,000 units of AGEs, advanced glycation products, okay? So anything that you fry is going to be off the charts high in AGEs. Um, the more you cook with dry heat, the worse it gets. Wet heat's not as bad. All right, so anyways, look at this. Chestnuts, um, nuts in general, tended to range between 2,000 to 6,000 units of AGEs. That's a lot of AGEs. Chestnuts here, peanuts here. Al almonds, walnuts, cashews, they're all high in AGEs, advanced glycation end products. And you don't absorb all of them, but you do absorb a significant amount of them. You also can produce them inside your body. That's called endogenous production, especially in the context of diabetes. Diabetes is the main way you produce them. Like when you talk about the hemoglobin A1C for diabetes, that's glycation of hemoglobin. Okay, and then you look at these plant foods, hardly any, next to nothing, you know. You know, these guys, you're in the thousands. With this, you're, you're talking, you know, in the ballpark of 10, 20, it's like essentially nothing. It's normal to have some, and the body's very good at clearing them, but it's not easy for your body when you start getting up into the thousands, okay? Your body's used to dealing with stuff like this. Okay, a little bit about fat and blood flow. I've talked about this before in some lectures, but I'll just briefly mention it here. You know, when you eat fat, and let, let's say saturated fat, it interacts with your neutrophils, your white blood cells in your blood, and it activates them. It activates them. They release some of this MPO, myeloperoxidase, which is positively charged. They call that being cation. Cation is the positive ions. 
And those actually cause collapse of the glycocalyx. Glycocalyx normally is around your endothelial cells, your arterial lining cells, and it has a negative charge on it. That's called the endothelial cell zeta potential. And when the MPO, myeloperoxidase, binds to it, it's positive charge collapsed on the glycocalyx, and then you expose these prothrombotic molecules on here that can bind to WBCs, to white blood cells, and this can be part of initiating atherosclerosis. So high-fat diets, they're proatherogenic. Okay, a single high-fat meal can also provoke what is called pathologic erythrocyte remodeling, meaning it can cause a change in the shape of some of your red blood cells. Okay, this one was done with cow's milk where the main fats were sat fat, uh, palmitate C16 fat, and oleate, the one we just talked about, the MUFA, you know, C18 with one double bond at the nine position. So anyways, here's examples of how it can distort the shape of red blood cells. You can get acanthocytes, acantho means thorn. So just in one spot is kind of what that implies, an acanthocyte, echinocyte, implies like equidistant all around, like an echinid, the animal. And so you just get more of these spurs. So I'm just making the point, you know, you're not going to deliver oxygen effectively when some of your red cells are becoming deformed like that. You'll also get an accelerated tendency of something called phosphatidylserine externalization. And what that means is you've got a outer facing uh, part of the bilator leaflet, and you got an inner facing of your phospholipid bilayer on the outer surface of your cells, your red blood cells in particular we're talking about here. And you more rapidly externalize phosphatidylserine. It'll flip into the um, outer leaflet of the plasma membrane of your red blood cells. And that makes them stiffer. That's part of the aging of a red blood cell. So it's, it's accelerating the rate of aging of your red blood cells. And it's decreasing um, the flexibility, making it harder for them to go through the uh, capillaries in the spleen. So they're going to get uh, removed sooner. Okay, here's about leaky gut. Normally when you eat fiber, the fiber feeds the good bacteria and they make butyrate. We talked about that, the four carbon short chain fatty acid. And then that's used to make tight junctions in your lining cells. And that prevents bacteria and bacterial endotoxins getting into your blood. When you have a shortage of fiber, your gram negative bacteria make LPS, lipopolysaccharide. Your gram positive bacteria make LTA, lipotychoic acid. Those get into your blood and they're very prothrombotic. They're very strongly prothrombotic. And what they'll do is they'll change the shape of fibrinogen floating around in your blood. That's a clotting protein. And instead of being alpha helix cylindrical shaped like a slinky, they'll make it flat like paper. And now these hydrogen bonds that normally were within the molecule, intra, intra within the molecule, they'll make them inter, inter meaning between the molecules. And they'll start sticking together and stacking up all these fibrinogen. So they're, they're making the fibrinogen more predisposed to clotting and even clotting in an abnormal way. Um, this is called amyloidogenic clotting. This is also like the same, similar to the concept of how prions work. So it's bad, okay? It just makes you more prone to forming clots and clots that are more difficult to lyse, to reverse. So it's a, they're highly thrombogenic. They have a strong clotting tendency. So all of these things increase your risk of occluding an artery and having a stroke or heart attack. Okay, uh, we talked in the past about dietary fat accumulation in the skeletal muscle is the first detectable finding of insulin resistance. And this is, goes back to the work. We've known that increased dietary fat increases insulin resistance going all the way back to the 1920s, the J. Shirley Sweeney paper, the Hemsworth paper, the Rabinowitz paper, et cetera, um, the work of Lester Morrison, but also the work of uh, Shulman is the guy who's shown it with nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, Gerald Shulman. You could watch his videos on the internet real easy. Just type in Gerald Shulman, diabetes lecture. He won the Banting Award in, 19, uh, in, two, in 2018 as the best diabetes researcher in the world. And he'll talk about this ectopic fat theory. He'll talk about uh, the first finding of insulin resistance. Um, he's even got a more recent uh, uh, lecture at Miami uh, Internal Medicine lecture where he gives his most recent findings. So anyways, this is pretty well established and known. Okay, so you want to decrease your risk of diabetes. You want to reduce your dietary fat. Um, and then this is just showing all the, the way fat accumulates in more location. Okay, so yeah, what I what I had on that last slide was, in my experience, lots of diabetic patients and their families say, oh, my diabetes is under control, it's under control, I'm taking my pills, my sugars are okay. But the wrong attitude with type 2 diabetes, what you should be thinking in the beginning is, how can I cure this? Instead of just settle for pills the rest of your life, you go low-fat, uh, vegan, optimize your body weight as well, you got a good chance to reverse it you know, while you still have an intact pancreas and your beta cells are making insulin. Once your beta cells fail, then potentially those cells become you know, dead, necrotic, you might not be able to reverse it anymore. So insulin normally binds to the insulin receptor after a meal. 
and it causes the, this is in a skeletal muscle, there's cytoplasmic vesicles containing glucose type 4 transporters, and the glucose 4 transporters then move up to the wall. The vesicle merges with the plasma membrane. These glucose type 4 transporters are installed into the membrane, and they then are channels to allow glucose to come into the cell. So the skeletal muscle can take up that glucose. It can store some of it as glycogen. It can use it as energy. That's what normally should happen. So eating a meal is called prandial. So this is normal postprandial insulin sensitivity, insulin doing its job as it's designed to do. However, when you eat excessive amounts of fats, especially saturated fat, they'll inhibit electron transport in your inner mitochondrial membrane. It'll start to stop, even back up. You'll start leaking electrons down here, making reactive oxygen species. But the point is when you stop this process, it gets sensed as something called um, overnutrition. And I actually drew this slide here to show that, you know, in the regular college pre-med books and the medical student books, you'll hear almost nothing about mitochondria inhibitors. But I knew they were a big deal in common and I was interested in studying mitochondria and mitochondria inhibition. I very quickly found 50 of them, over 50 of them. And there's tons of things and these are common things. Statins can decrease mitochondrial function. Fungal inhibitors, which are in all these processed foods and personal care products can be mitochondrial inhibitors, okay? GP in your processed food, okay? And your in your uh, processed soy food that's not organic. Atrazine, your high fructose corn syrup, your uh, non-organic corn sprayed with that stuff, okay? Metformin, super common uh, medicine, all right? There's lots of medicine in here that can be mitochondrial inhibitors, including your SSRIs for antidepressants, okay? Your antipsychotics, your Haldol, for example. I wouldn't be messing around with that. I would avoid all these things as much as I can, okay? And so what I'm saying is you don't want to keep adding these things up. That's another reason why I'm a big believer in low-fat diets. Um, all right. So anyways, the, the cell, when it's when you have excessive amounts of dietary fat, especially saturated fat, it can give a signal, so-called overnutrition signal, and then block these glucose type 4 transporters from going up to the plasma membrane. And that causes insulin resistance. So the insulin is bound here, but it's not able to get the glucose type 4 up to the skeletal muscle plasma membrane because of this overnutrition signal, if you will. And I mean, I can go into more detail about the diacylglycerol and Shulman goes into all the detail of it. I'm just saying overnutrition because that's a simplified way to say all the steps that happen. And there's, there's a whole bunch of known steps that happen and we don't need to go into that. Uh, but that's what it's all about. So now the glucose can't get in the cell. I'm showing this arrow of it bouncing off. So it stays high in the blood, high glucose in the blood. That's hyperglycemia having occurred after a meal that's called postprandial hyperglycemia. Uh, later on, when you get a fatty liver, the liver starts having problems with managing uh, blood glucose and insulin. And then that would be called fasting hyperglycemia. And that'll give you a fasting blood sugar elevation. Okay. Um, the other thing too, is they've done studies to try to figure out, you know, how can they slow the fat getting into the skeletal muscle? What they found was it appears to be just traveling across the plasma membrane. So even if you block the CD36 typical fatty acid transporter, it didn't matter just in proportion to its concentration in the blood, it was getting into the skeletal muscle, getting across these membranes. So this is sort of a classic paper on the subject. This guy, Anthony J and James Hamilton, uh, they did a lot of work on it. So that was a paper that showed that. And it just makes you say, well, gee, the smart move is reduce your uh, dietary fat. Okay, here's a normal electron transport. You know, electron transport is like a fireman bucket brigade. The electrons are passed down from uh, complex to complex until they get to complex four. And then oxygen is the ultimate electron acceptor gets converted into water and simultaneously they had been pumping protons into the intramembranous space between the outer mitochondrial membrane, inner mitochondrial membrane, and this gradient is harvested at ATP synthase complex number five to make ATP. That's how mitochondria make energy. This is how life on earth in mammals exists. This is how we all make the vast majority of our energy. And that's why it's worth knowing because common things inhibit this and you want your mitochondria functioning well all kinds of action in the human body. What makes us healthy, what gives us energy comes down to this mitochondrial electron transport chain. And whether or not we get cancer, whether or not we become demented, a lot of it comes down to what's happening right here in this set of things. So you want it to work well, and it works well on a low fat vegan diet. And uh, when, it, when it's blocked by high fat diets or these mitochondrial inhibitors, that increases your risk of all kinds of uh, really significant diseases, okay? Uh, I'm just showing a bunch of other things can inhibit it. We're not going to get into all that today. Okay, here is oxygen delivery in a tissue. So normally the red blood cells are passing through a capillary. Again, they're about seven microns in diameter. A capillary is about five microns, so they have to bend on themselves a little bit to get through there. Um, these little blue circles are the oxygen being delivered. So it exits the uh, capillary. This is the capillary basement membrane, the yellow. 
these uh, green things here are the muscle cells, vascular smooth muscle cells. You know, normally you can call them vascular smooth muscle cells in the brain. You can call them pericytes. And they do thin out around the capillaries, but the, ox the oxygen has to pass from the red blood cell, exit from its hemoglobin, and then travel to the cell, to the tissue that needs it. Uh, let's say here's your brain cell, your neuron, to make ATP. All right. But when you got diabetes, you'll get thickening of this uh, capillary basement membrane over time. And you got hypertension, you're going to get thickening of this vascular muscle layer. And you'll also get collagen, scar tissue, fibrosis laid down in the well. So less oxygen is going to get to these tissues. And that's going to cause decreased function of the tissue, decreased function of your heart muscle, decreased function of your brain, et cetera, any part of your body. Okay, um, your brain cells really need this oxygen to get there. So all of these things are bad. So what I'm kind of saying here, why am I showing you all this? These high fat diets are, are causing insulin resistance and they're decreasing your ability to deliver oxygen to your tissues. And that's gonna, over time, it takes decades for all this to happen, but it's gonna gradually decrease your cognitive function, increase your cancer risk, et cetera. You don't want that. Okay, this was just showing the gut. Um, I really should have had this cell with my other time when I just talked about leaky gut, but here's the gist of um, preventing leaky gut. The most important thing is you eat enough fiber it goes to the good gut bacteria. They convert the fiber into short chain fatty acids. And the short chain fatty acids, the two carbon and three carbon ones, acetate and propionate, they go to your liver through the portal vein and your liver can make them into whatever fat it wants. Um, except for the, the two essential ones we talked about, the, uh, you know, the omega-6 and the omega-3 essentials, the linoleic acid for omega-6 and the linolenic acid for omega-3s. All right, but the reason I'm showing you this is that this butyrate in particular is used by the gut lining cells, the enterocytes, to make tight junctions, and that's how you prevent leaky gut. So that's why I jokingly say that fiber is the only good fat because it travels through your gut and it protects you from leaky gut, and then it gets made into the butyrate to protect you from leaky gut. The, so it gets made in these three short-chain fatty acids. So, you know, four carbons or less, these are all short-chain fatty acids in comparison to those big honking, you know, C18s that we were talking about earlier. So... Fiber protects you from leaky gut, the most important thing to be protected from. The same thing, by the way, fiber also helps maintain your blood-brain barrier of your brain. So it protects you from brain disorders and dementia. Fiber is your friend. It really does a lot of good things for you. It also facilitates uh, excretion from your, uh, your stool by defecation of excessive cholesterol and excessive estrogenic chemicals. Okay, so it's beneficial in numerous ways. And you only get fiber from plant foods. You don't get it from animal foods. They don't have any fiber. So I'm just trying to show you all the wonderful things it does. These are all things that cause leaky gut. So these are all things I would avoid, try to avoid if I had autoimmune disease or leaky gut problems. But sometimes even when you avoid all that, you still have leaky gut. You still have autoimmune diseases and there's other things you could do. So we talked about that earlier. So when you got leaky gut, you're getting LPS, bacterial endotoxin um, into your sub, uh, sub epithelial layer. And you're also getting into your blood, prothrombotic. You're getting these big chunks of protein that can cause molecular mimicry, autoantibody diseases as well. I gave separate lectures. I got whole lectures on autoimmune disease uh, earlier with Chef AJ um, some months ago. Okay, then what's the best thing to do? Eat your starch. With starch, the polymer glucose, low caloric density, stretches your stomach, early satisfaction of hunger, goes into your small intestine here, and it takes time for the enzymes to peel off the fiber, separate it from the glucose. The glucose is slowly absorbed like a slow release, slow release energy pill. You satisfy your hunger with the fewest number of calories. That makes you thin and it makes you healthy. Um, out of all my years, I've been a doctor over 30 years. The most important thing I ever learned my whole life about health is if you feed a population, primarily starch, they tend to be thin and relatively healthy, okay? All the healthy populations eat primarily starch. Um, if you eat simple sugars where there's no fiber, like one of those energy drinks with high fructose corn syrup and also a lot of glucose in there, you'll spike your blood glucose and you'll have a tendency to be at risk for rebound hypoglycemia. But anyways, these are all your starches, rice, beans, potatoes, uh, sweet potatoes, quinoa, oatmeal, carrots, et cetera. Um, so that's good to know. This is what I call the Spartan vegan, sort of my version of it. It's all pretty similar, but you know, get these lifestyle things squared away, you know, managing your stress, your relationships and all that eat your starches on top of that, eat some fruits, but fruits, you know, they're kind of expensive. They don't store that long, but you know, I do think fruits are a good thing in, but you can, you can get carried away with them. You know, like I said, I, after I eat my big bowl of starch, I have to stop. I can't eat any more starch, but even after I've stuffed myself as much as I can with starch, I can always eat a lot more fruits and I can actually eat whatever fruit you put in front of me. So they don't, they don't satisfy hunger the same way a starch does. Yeah. I, I agree with you. So how do these raw foodies do it? Yeah, that's a point though, because because there's a lot of these raw foodies that they're almost pretty thin. And, but I, one of the problems of going raw food, and I'm not an expert on the whole raw food diet is 
they often, some of them often are thin and then they start wanting to seek out fats. So I, that's that's a topic. Maybe I'll talk about that in the future. That actually be something I can talk about in the future. I can really study that in more detail. I've studied it, but not enough that I'm going to be able to answer every nuance. I'm not not there yet. Um, veggies, you know, veggies got a lot of healthy things in them, and not to mention just the uh, the nitrates, for example. We talked about that before. And then the only supplement I take is you know vitamin B12, methylcobalamin. I wouldn't take cyano. I don't want cyano to accumulate, but I like methylcobalamin. You can even take a sublingual version of it so you don't have to worry about all the gut issues for absorption. Um, and then I jokingly make this in the diet nirvana pyramid. So I say, this is how you you work your way towards uh, nutritional dietary nirvana. You start out, I, I kind of jokingly call the paleo keto low carb is health hell. Um, and then I then the sad diet is an awful diet, makes people sick. And uh, the Mediterranean diet, I jokingly, call that pseudo intellectual ignoramuses because when people want to act like they know what they're talking about with nutrition, they say, well, I've heard the Mediterranean diet is good. They don't even know what they're talking about. There's all kinds of problems with Mediterranean diet. I actually think it's a lousy diet. It's an excuse to eat high fat foods like fish and olive oil and stuff. That's not good for you. Even alcohol. I don't think it's a healthy diet at all. And then I jokingly say you work, you know, towards this, the organic fruit, uh, veggies and starch based primarily diet. That's the healthiest. All right. So anyway, the other thing too, I say a trick in studies is they, a lot of studies, I think, made soy look much better than it really is by comparing it to meat and dairy. And I noticed with nuts, you know, and um, that Nelson pointed, Jeff Nelson pointed this out as well, that, and I saw it when I looked at the papers, the nut groups were often just healthier people in general, sort of, I call it a yuppie effect, okay? And so it made the nuts look better than they are. And like I said, I don't think nuts are that bad, but I don't think they're a health food. I think they're just an okay plant food. OK, and, and for the person who wants to gain weight for the person, let's say you're 20 years old and you're running on the cross country team, you can go ahead and eat some nuts. I know my own body, though, my body, if I left it to eat whatever it wanted, I would be fat. OK, so I don't I want to avoid fat foods for that reason, too. OK, I had a brief fat phase in my life in my 30s, and it took me a couple of years to overcome it until I figured out all this starch stuff and low fat stuff. And so I don't want to go back to that being fat ever again. And I never have. And I don't intend to ever go back to it. I'm about 60 now and I feel like I'm aging good. I'm strong. I'm energetic. I can concentrate all day long. And you look at all these, um, what I've noticed is people's brains tend to age well because the average American after 60, they're cognitively slow. Whereas you look at all these um, sort of old vegans, you know, these guys are really mentally sharp. Yeah. Cobalt Esselin is about 90, okay? T. Colin Campbell is about the same age, okay? And Dr. McDougall is super sharp. He's about, you know, his mid seventies. Okay. Their brains are aging sh sharp. Okay. And you'll see that amongst a lot of these other vegans too. So I just let you know that. Cause I think that's a big thing to talk about, you know, um, you know, okay. Okay. Anyways, I've kind of said this before. I think healthy aging is be like Adam and Eve, but, um, keep your indoor heating and plumbing. And, um, I think that's about the best you can do. So I hope that was helpful. Really great. Do you want to uh, stop your screen share? Uh, sure. So I took a, I, there's a few questions that have been sent in in advance. So we'll get to those first. And, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned Jane Hightower because she actually is not too far from me. I've never interviewed her, but it reminds me that maybe I should, because I first saw her at a McDougal advanced study weekend quite a long time ago. Yeah, I, I thought her book was quite interesting. All these demented yuppies, nobody else knew how to help them. And she figured out how to help them. The main thing she did was tell them, stop eating fish. You blew my mind when you said how many fish are in one fish capsule. I don't think people realize that, you, you know, fish aren't like oranges. You don't just squeeze them and the oil comes out. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of... Yuck. Well, I know what a lot of people are thinking, which is, well, okay, so, but what about vegan DHA? Well, what I would say is if you have a specific need, and to me, the context where I would potentially take it was if um, I had an autoimmune disease that hadn't responded to other things, you know, you tried to stop the leaky gut, you weren't able to get under control, you tried to avoid some, you know, toxic chemicals, you weren't able to get under control, then I would say, well, try that because that might help you turn things around and not have to go overboard. Like what I would consider going overboard, I mean, those medicines that the that the rheumatologists use to treat autoimmune disease, that's powerful stuff like methotrexate. It's like chemotherapy. <laughs> Whereas the omega, you know, the omega-3s, there's a little of this, a little of that. There are some potential problems with it, but it's not like uh, methotrexate. 
you know, I, I've never had fish oil, but at one point I tasted vegan DHA and it was as if I was taking fish. I mean, it, I just, it was so disgusting tasting and I, I could, I could like, I was burping it up all day. I took it one time. Yeah. So I, I'm, I don't think, I think it's a special circumstance situation. And I know there's some people who think they've kind of got under this mindset. Oh, I've heard I've got to take it or I'm going to become demented or I'm going to have a heart attack or something. Yeah. Oh, is, is it good where I'm at or no? Yeah. 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 You, you moved your computer, your head was saying, yeah. Cause a lot, you know, what about preventing dementia, preventing strokes? You know, we hear that it's, it's that, that vegans often have low DHA. Do you think we should get our, uh, our no. fatty acid profile? I don't, I don't think you need to check it. I think you just forget about it. <laughs> but people I, are worried about it. You know, well, I, I know. And I, well, that's kind of why I'm telling you that there, there's one study that showed a benefit. Of, there's a whole bunch of bigger ones that show no benefit of it. When I look at the logic of the mechanisms, I don't see a way that it's going to be helpful. And then what scares me is that stuff about mitochondrial inhibition. Because to me, anything that inhibits mitochondrial, mitochondria, to me, I would think would increase the risk of dementia. So nobody's studied yet. Not many people are aware of the issue of mitochondrial inhibition. I previously talked about that, you know, that, the Peter Rogers MD theory. I mean, basically, you got a baseline metabolic rate in your neuron and you have a baseline glucose and oxygen delivery. All right. So anything that increases your metabolic rate, you have to normally have neurovascular coupling, meaning increase your glucose and oxygen delivery. But when you activate a neuron, you have to then pump the calcium out of the cytoplasm. So anything that lowers your ATP production capacity, which potentially these omega-3s do, like from fish oil, that's going <laughs> to decrease your ability to get that calcium out of the cytoplasm and you run the risk of excitotoxicity. Excitotoxicity means that you have increased metabolic rate of that neuron out of proportion to what you can deliver for glucose and oxygen. And so anything that inhibits a mitochondria is equivalent to dropping glucose and oxygen delivery. Makes sense? So if you're adding one more mitochondrial inhibitor to your, to your you know, the last straw that broke the camel's back, you don't want to do that. That increases your risk of losing that neuron to excitotoxicity and apoptosis. So that's why I'm a big believer in simplicity. I almost feel we should call this show Dr. Rogers Mini Medical School. Well, you know, it's uh how long does it take for you to prepare for each show? I'm guessing hours. Well, what happens is I get interested in the subject and I like to try to find a book to read because it's very easy for me to read a book. Um, and then I start reading the book and the book suggests a paper. I start looking up the paper and I work a lot. I work way too much. Okay, but when I when I have my days off. I'll then make a list of everything I'm going to do that day. And I'm, I'm actually pretty good about it. I'll make a list of all the papers I'm going to read and what I'm going to read, and I'll do it. And I'll just crank through all those papers and sort of like, I'll show you one of the books I read. I read this guy's book. Where the heck is it? Here it is. Peskin's book. Okay. And now this guy, he sells PEOs, Brian Peskin. He's totally biased. He wants to sell his PEOs. Like I said, you can get your PEOs from eating plants. You don't need to buy the supplement. Okay. But he gets me looking into the literature. So then once I'm in the literature, then I start reading other things. I watch all the YouTube videos on the subject I can. I go back to my books. I see if there's anything in my biochem books or my other books. I got, I got tons of books. Like, oh, let me see what's my book in here. Well, I got them in my bathroom. I keep a lot of my books in my bathroom. That's a common place where I read. Oh my, I got all these like nutritional, you know, PhD, agricultural schools, biochemistry books, not to mention my regular ones. So anyways, I put all this stuff together and I also start thinking of things, you know? And whenever I watch uh, the videos, I take notes and I go through all of them and I sort of integrate it over time because I always start out like and have like two or three times as many slides as I need. Then I start saying to myself, what's interesting? What's relevant? How can I narrow this down? And I also, you know, everybody has insight moments. Like when you first wake up in the morning, for example, is a common time. I'll always write that note down. I'll throw that note card down on the, on the table in front of my computer. And then I'll just add it in later. I'm like, what are people going to care about? They're going to want to know what's the pros and cons of each thing. And then they're going to want to know, you know, what's their best chance to win the game, so to speak. So I try to get all that in there. And then also you run into problems. People say, well, what about this? What about this? So I try to address those, those nuance issues, you know? So, and, th and then in the end, you sort of say, what's the risk benefit ratio? And so sort of like, it's like, I don't, I don't see a benefit to these omega-3s and they're potentially going to inhibit your mitochondria and immunosuppress you unless you have an autoimmune disease. Then I would say, yeah, then I would go that route. That's, um, um, that's interesting that you said that because one of the questions that was submitted in advance from Laura was Dr. Rogers, what do you think about eating a half a cup of flax or chia seeds today? So if somebody, if somebody was doing like Dr. Brooke Goldner's protocol, they, they generally have an autoimmune disease. So that's a different case than just us regular folk. Okay. Well, I, I do see some intelligent things there. If you have an autoimmune disease, 
you're then getting the source, you're getting the PEO, the parent essential amino. The only essential ones are the C18s that are found in plants. So I think that would be a wise way to go about that. However, um, if you're a healthy person, you don't have any of these problems, I would not personally seek out flax or chia or any of this stuff. Because like I said, those are estrogenic chemicals. They are high fat. I don't want to eat extra dietary fat if I don't need to, um, if I'm not, you know, specifically pursuing that. So, and like I said, my body left to its own wills. If I just ate whatever was around me, and didn't even think about anything, I'd be fat. So I don't want to be fat. Right. So, so for the people that don't have an autoimmune disease, you're, I, I understand you correctly. They don't need to worry about having that tablespoon of flax. No, or, yeah, no I don't think, you know, and I'm, pretty knowledgeable about, you know, I studied very extensively things that cause dementia. I would not pursue it because I think most of the papers showing no benefit. And then you got all these potential problems, mitochondrial inhibition, immune suppression, increased prostate cancer risk. The risk benefit ratio looks to me like it ain't worth it. So in you're a, an interventional neuroradiologist. So you see scans and you, you, you see a lot of people with dementia. Yeah. Well, I'd say that I, I look at demented patients every day, but I also, I think about it. And I say, what causes dementia? What can I do to reduce the risk? And basically, I think the whole dementia literature is a big joke, as most medical conventional medicine literatures are, because it'll talk about Alzheimer's dementia. And Alzheimer's is a big joke. You can't diagnose it specifically based on a clinical history question, a physical exam, finding a lab test, or an imaging test even. okay, Even at autopsy, they can't confidently identify it most of the time. Um, the neurofibrillary tangles, you know, so we, we, I've talked about that before. So what I'm trying to say is, what really works for dementia is the Jack Delatory theory of mouse equivalence. I talked about that before. Excuse me, that's the vascular hypothesis of dementia, the one he's tying off the mouse carotids. And then my own theory, I call that the neurovascular uncoupling theory, which is really an expanded detailed version of the calcium hypothesis. Basically, it tells you, avoid anything that inhibits your mitochondria. Avoid anything that raises your metabolic rate in your brain cells for no reason, because you're going to have to meet those demands. And if you can't meet them, you're going to lose the brain cells. And then avoid anything that lowers your glucose and oxygen delivery. So what I like about those theories, deletories in mind, they tell you exactly what to do. And they give you a rationale that makes sense versus somebody that says, well, this is associated with better outcomes. I have to wonder about those, especially if I don't see a mechanism and I see a counter mechanism. So like I said, I see a counter mechanism with this omega-3 stuff and like with the fish, you know, you're going to improve your brain by eating mercury. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, that, that did our, I mean, I know our ancestors didn't have access to a lot of things, but did, did they get omega-3 fatty acids in their diet? I don't think they ate too much of them. And that's also why I was kind of joking about the whole Africa stuff, okay? So like, I personally don't really think we specifically have that much in common with chimps. Our brain's three times as big. And I was also kind of joking about the woman in the sense that a chimp doesn't look anything like a woman. Those two twins look about five or 10% like each other. Chimps don't look at all like, like us. So I'm, I'm using these arguments kind of playing them both ways in a sense, you know what I'm saying? So if we really are from chimps, Chimps have nothing to do whatsoever with omega-3s and nothing whatsoever to do with fish. All right. So that was kind of my joke. Same with gorillas. Okay. Uh, so I was kind of having a little fun with that, but I, I don't think we need them at all. And also if we came from Africa, we, we, we didn't necessarily for sure come from Africa. We might've, we might've come from Europe originally and then gone back to Africa. There's different theories about that, but I'm kind of joking. That's about as hot as it gets. You don't need these extra omega-3s in a hot climate. So anyway, you, you go down that path, it doesn't point you towards omega-3. That's what I thought was funny about that evolutionary arguments for it. Um, I don't I don't think it's that big of a deal. I do think there, there it's obviously is in higher concentration in the eyes and in the brain of a baby developing. So I think, you know, there's reasons why breast milk is the best thing, all right? But when you start talking about breast milk, it's not the same thing as some formula where they add some processed chemical in there, which is quite often oxidized, et cetera. That's not the same thing. That's interesting that you said that because, you know, just today, I don't know whose list I was on, but was saying DHA is important right from the start of life. Scientists have shown that it's essential for the development of your retina and brain and infants who don't get enough DHA have visual and cognitive impairments. Yeah, I laugh, though, because, you know, they talk about putting DHA in a formula, but the way they process it makes it toxic. And then the formula is in an aluminum can with a BPA lining with high fructose corn syrup sweetener and things like that. And previously with MSG. So I'm kind of laughing, you know, <laughs> I, I, I think, I, I think it was McDougal who called formula feeding child abuse. Okay. So I, I'm, I'm kind of laughing, but yeah, from breast milk 
there's a benefit to it. You do need some. And that's also why women store it on their, on their hips and their, and their thighs. Cause it's an energy efficient spot to carry those omega threes. All right. So there is a rationale for it, but pursuing it the rest of your life, I don't think there's a point in it. I think it's you, the, the amount you get from plant foods is what you need. Cause like, what is it? Probably around 1% of it gets converted to these eventual derivatives. You mostly need just the simple one you get from plants. The, the C18 carbon one, the linoleic acid. That's what your mitochondria run on. So. Yeah. Do you take any supplements at all? The only thing I take is a uh, methylcobalamin form of B12, nothing else. Okay. Like you take it every day. No, I take it about twice a month, you know, and I, I you know, if the dosage just works out that well. And the other thing too, you hear all this stuff, whatever somebody who wants to sell you something does, they first try to convince you that you lack something. Oh, all the old people are physically weak. They're all sarcopenic. They need to eat more protein. Okay. That's, I think that's all nonsense. They need more omega threes. I think that's nonsense. And, um, and not to brag, but you know, like I said, I do. I, I sometimes go to the gym and lift weights at young guys. I could do a set of 78 pushups with good form, probably a 64. But what I'm trying to say is that's more than all the young guys could do. And so I always tease them that, you know, they got their cell phone in the front pocket and microwaving their balls all day. That's why they're weak. But but what I'm trying to say is you don't need all that stuff to be strong. I never took anything because all these young people too, they're kind of nuts. They're like, well, I'm thinking about going on testosterone. I'm like, what the heck for you, idiot? You know, and and they're they're all interested in all these like muscle building supplements. I'm like, just lift, get your sleep, you're gonna be fine. You know, it's like have that intensity when you lift, not this look magic, um, magic pill approach. How many years ago did you change your diet to a starch paste diet? Well, I I got fat in my mid early to mid thirties when I did like two fellowships simultaneously, and I couldn't lose weight for about three years. And then I did all this reading, and I gradually got to becoming a vegetarian, except for the milk. So I was a a lacto vegetarian, and then I was still would occasionally bounce back into me a little heavy. And then I discovered McDougal's work and the starch uh, based diet. And I've been that way. <clears throat> um, I was that way ever since it's been over 20 years, but then when did I become hundred percent vegan? That was probably about 2018. Um, and I've sort of never looked back from that. And the more time goes by, the more I narrow it down. Like I, I, I quit drinking coffee probably about four years ago. Um, and I'm glad that, cause I like to keep everything real simple. And then people will say, well, how do you know it's working? And the reason why I know it's working is because of what I can do. I, I'm getting stronger and stronger in the weight room. And I also know all these people say, oh, I can't concentrate. I got brain fog, my attention deficit. I'm like, my problem is I, I concentrate too much. Like when I start working on a project I'm interested in, I got to force myself to get up or I'll sit there for three hours, four hours, just working on the project. And so I got to make myself go do something, you know, um, go do the laundry or something. So what I'm trying to say is everything's working. You know, uh, and and from my study and review of it and my interaction with other people, the ones who go more down this path of really simplifying it, like sort of the Spartan vegan approach, they're happy with it. I've had patients tell me, you know, they had a hard time getting their hypertension in control until they started avoiding these dietary fats or their weight in control. Once they avoided, you know, the extra nuts or the olive oil or whatever, um, you know, and I remember reading your book. You, I think you said that as well. You read my book. I'm very honored. Thank you. I'm, I think it's the best weight loss book. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. That is, is, is quite a compliment. But you know, a lot of people think I'm being irresponsible and I don't tell people not to eat nuts. Just like you, I don't eat nuts and seeds and I don't worry about it. But I do have my levels checked once a year just because I have a vegan doctor and that's just one of the tests he runs. And my, my, pro, my omega-3 fatty acids are just, Perfect. They're actually high because I eat a lot of greens. Yeah. I mean, that's where the fish gets them from too. So that's what we're designed to do. And they come in the packaging that your gut's made, your body's made to take it from that and, and send it to wherever it needs it. And it's mitochondria. I think that's the way to do stuff is to try to live like the way we're designed to live rather than try to trick our bodies all the time. You know, do you, um, do you avoid nuts mainly because of their caloric density and you don't, you feel there's nothing in it you need, or you don't really think they're harmful though. No, I just think they're high fat and I don't want the extra fat. Um, they don't have anything I need. Like I used to eat Brazil nuts for a while for a couple of years. I would have, you know, a couple of Brazil nuts every month because I thought I maybe needed them for selenium. But the more I read about selenium, I realized I get plenty of it from others, you know, just eating my plant foods. So that's why I stopped eating the nuts and I don't need the extra fat. And then, like I said, too, the reason why I'm pretty happy with how I've been, and I've been this way for years is that I know I got great productivity, you know? Um, so like I said, I, I can concentrate. I can, I'd be real strong in the weight room. I, I can run up, you know, 
10 flights of stairs like that. So I'm like, everything's good. Yep. Thank you. But you, but you're a lone wolf, right? In terms of your family and your, and your colleagues. Right. Yeah. Cause I, cause, cause, cause most people, they just don't get it. You know, it's sort of like, they always like to attribute a success to just natural ability. They go, Oh, you're just smart or you're just strong. I'm like, I trained myself to be this way. Okay. And they just don't want to do it. And like I said too, you know, like the typical patient, you know, they'll agree to anything. They'll agree to anything, a tube up the butt, they'll agree to a craniotomy, a, a buzzsaw on the sternum, anything. Okay. But you tell them, you know, I think you need to change your diet. Oh, not that, you know. It's, Why do you think it's so hard for people? Because it's easy to submit to a thing that they think is only going to happen once. It's not easy to really change your behavior um, and to, you know, to make the effort to study and learn. I love studying and learning and trying to improve things. Most people don't though. Most people sort of fixed in their ways. A lot of people take it as an insult or offensive if you, if you, in a sense, they feel like you're correcting them. And what I'm saying is, unless you're mentally flexible and willing to learn and change, how can you improve? I'm curious, where do you stand on the conversation of food addiction? Because Dr. McDougal is, doesn't believe in it, but other doctors that I have on the show, many of them actually think it's a real thing. Well, I, I think you do become addicted to these foods because it's a concept of the glutamate. I thought that was really interesting, that one book, um, Fat, Stressed, and Sick, that was by Catherine Reed. She's the one that was a protein chemist, and she studied the effect of glutamate on foods. Basically, in your brain, over 90% of the neurotransmitters are glutamate. It's an excitatory neurotransmitter, okay? And it's, it's keyed in with all of your reward neurotransmission and whatnot. And the point is... Our ancestors worried about starving to death. So if they found a food that activated these glutamate receptors, which we have in our mouth and in other parts of our intestinal tract, they got reward neurotransmitters being released for that because it was sort of saying to them, this is good. Go back to this location, get this food here because it'll keep you alive. So the food manufacturers, they've learned how to trick our bodies. <clears throat> They just process, the more you process a, a protein, the more you break it up into its individual amino acids and the more you free up the glutamate. So the more it hits your mouth is this big bolus of glutamate and your body says, yes, I found what I've been looking for. So they just trick you. And of course, we talked about the bliss point idea. The food manufacturers, they know how to do that. They put the amount of sugar, salt, fat, mouth texture, and glutamate to make the person just love it. And the people will just be addicted to it. And they'll see the average person, they're not aware of what's happening behind the scenes to trick them into liking that food. So they're just like, I love the taste of whatever it is, of chocolate, of cheese, of you know, uh, potato chips, whatever, because they don't recognize they're being tricked into it. And so that's why they do become addicted to it and they won't change, they won't quit. And there's more psychology to it too. I've seen people from different ethnic groups, they feel like they have to eat a food to be true to their ethnic nationality or something. And um, all of these things, also I've seen alcoholics, of course, addicted to alcohol. And they're like, oh, doc, the feeling, you don't understand the feeling. I go, <laughs> well, it ain't a good one. So anyways, I do think people become addicted to foods and they won't change. And like I said, too, I've had these conversations and it's not just because people are stupid. I had these conversations with lots of doctors. They, they can't make themselves change. And I'm like, the way I look at it is, why would I poison myself? I look at all these processed foods as poisons. I'm like, why would I poison myself? I would not. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't eat that. And I think you almost have to do that in order to have that solidity. And I also like the idea of being a hundred percent yes or no, because if you're, if you're 90%, then you're always sort of teetering and tottering. Plus I think you end up with gut issues when you eat the hundred percent plant-based with all the fiber and stuff, my gut it's calm. It just does whatever it's supposed to versus I can remember early on when I was kind of going back and forth between meat and plants and all this, I would get these episodes of bloating and you know intermittent diarrhea or constipation or whatever versus your gut just gets used to eating plants all the time all the fiber it's sort of happy it calms down and it does what it's supposed to the hard part is you know being dressed up for winter in a bunch of layers coming home on a cold day your gut goes you're home and it's not ready for you to spend all this time taking off all the layers i won't go into any more detail than that but I think you get the well, point. That that's not I, I just looked it up on Amazon. It's a $36 book. It came out in it last year, but it sounds really good. That sounds like somebody I'd love to interview on the show. Oh, which one? Fat Stress and Sick? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That that's an interesting, interesting thing. And that gets into the heart of addiction. So what she's basically saying is the food companies at first had MSG, you know, that came like from the Japanese food, Ajinomoto company, but then they realize we don't even need MSG. Screw MSG, we don't need it. All we got to do is process the food more and we'll, we'll break it up in the gluten. Gluten is named because there's a lot more glutamate in it. 
Plus, casein, the milk, the meat pro, the milk protein got tons of gluten in it. So does soy and so does whey. All right. So you just process those more and you free up tons of glutamate. Um, and that makes people like the food. It rewards those neurotransmitters. So, um, but I, my concern about it is it can potentially have a significant excitatory effect on the brain and you don't want that. Okay. The brain is more fragile than people think it is. And I think the, that's why too, it's good to push yourself intellectually and pay attention to yourself intellectually. And so do something challenging intellectually and notice how am I doing? That's how you catch a problem early versus if, and like I said, a lot of people, their definition of healthy is, well, at least I'm not as fat as my cousin. But if you, if you make that your standard. Yeah. Do you so use the word fat in the hospital with your patients? Cause I noticed your very first line of the presentation was talking about the weight of the people in the hospital and that it's such a charged word right now. I do because I think that's the correct way to talk. I mean, I'm nice about it. I try to be thoughtful, but I think you have to be open and honest because quite often, you know, I know all these, like a lot of conventional medicine. I've been to conventional meetings at these, at these big famous hospitals. I'm not going to say the name of them, you know, on obesity and nutrition and stuff. And they're a big joke. What they say is we need to get more people to try to eat the Mediterranean diet or the keto version of the Mediterranean diet. Then they say, we need to get more patients on these uh, weight loss medicines. And then they also say, we need to get more patients going for bariatric surgery. They never once ever mentioned the low fat vegan diet. Okay. The low fat vegan diet is like this dirty little secret. Conventional medicine wants nothing to do with the low fat vegan diet because if people actually went with it, they would be healthy and skinny. I don't take any pills. I'm 60 years old. I'm strong and I'm smart and other, you know, vegans are like that. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is you keep people eating fat. I think there's a big push to get everybody eating plant foods, but to make them eat high fat plant foods, lots of high fat stuff, a lot of processed stuff to keep them fat and sick. So I will free up a lot of land. And I think there's, 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 you know, some people who want that to happen to have more land freed up, but they don't want the proles to be skinny and healthy. They want the proles fat and sick. Because as long as somebody's fat and sick, you can make a lot of money off them. You can keep you can keep on selling them pills. You can keep on selling them surgery. Um, so the low fat vegan diet, it is the friend of the prole, the friend of the poor people that empowers you. And some people say, well, I don't got the money to eat organic. Well, just eat starch and starch is cheap and starch has a good long storage time. It's, it's the poor man's friend. It really is. Wow. That, I really think that it's going to be hard for people to change, like you say, because it, these foods are so pervasive in our culture. Well, I know what you're saying is true. Most people, it's hard for them to change. They say, oh, I'm just not ready to do that. I'm like, fine, you can do whatever you want. I don't really care what people do. It's their life. It's their person. But I also tell them, you're screwed, okay? If you eat these high fat diets, all I see endless. I can tell you, I see so many fatty livers. I, ex I and you know, we have a macro for dictating a case. And on all my liver ultrasounds, I always, it, it automatically says fatty liver in there. And nine times out of 10, I just leave it in there, okay? Um, I, I have fatty liver. <clears throat> I see fatty liver so much. The majority of Americans over 50 have fatty liver. That's how fat and sick the population is. And also the majority of people I see over 60, they're cognitively slow. The average person over 60 has had one, at least one silent stroke, if not several of them already in the United States. So um, I, don't, I don't copy that. And so what I'm trying to say is a lot of people, they focus on trying to be normal, okay? Like I have some friends and family and stuff who say, well, I just wanna be normal. To me, I'm not at all like that. I wanna be, at the few things I care about, I wanna be great. I want to be the best I can be. And I think that's a much better way to think. You can't only do a few things in life. I mean, basically you spend a third of your life asleep, about a third of your life working, you got to make some money, you got to, then you got some family responsibilities, whatever they are. And then that little bit of time left over, that's yours to do whatever you want with yourself. And I want to get the most out of it, okay? I don't, why would I eat anything but the best food for myself? Why would I do anything that's not good for me, good for my health if I don't have to? I, I don't kind of get this mediocre stuff. I mean, if a person wants to be that way, fine, they can be that way, but- I don't want there's so much there, there's so much processed food and so much even vegan junk food. And I'm not really accepted by the vegan community because I don't eat that stuff. You know, that stuff wasn't even available 47 years ago when I became vegan. Oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. In the vegan community, there's like a divide. There's the high fat vegans and the low fat vegans. And the high fat vegans are more popular. They've got a lot more views on the Internet. They're a lot better known. They get invited to a lot of places. OK. And I think it's because once you go high fat vegan, you could sell a lot of popular stuff. You could sell soy, you could sell olive oil, 
Um, you could potentially say canola is okay. You could sell nuts. So these corporations want that word going around. Like, okay, fine. You guys want to eat plant-based? Fine. But why don't you have some nuts? Why don't you have this or that? And so I hate to say it, but it's just how it is. You know, the, the, the high fat promoters, that's where the money is. Um, and so my attitude, you know, I want to try to be the best nutrition doctor I can be. I want to try to become the best in the world someday if I could possibly be. It's hard for me to do though because I'm working all the time. I need more time. I wish there was a research institute you know, even if I had six months, I, I could rewrite some of these books that I want to do, uh, but I just don't have the time. So I do the best I can with the limited time that I have because it takes a lot of time to go through the papers. But everything I see, it, it's consistent with that whole idea of low fat is best, starch based is best, fruits are also very good and vegetables. It's, but it's it's a simple thing. It's not It's not a fancy thing. And I think it's simple because I think that's how humans are sort of designed to be. But still, so many people, even when they're already overweight or have diabetes, are afraid to eat starch and think that starch is going to make them fat. Yeah, it, it, it's the vast majority of people are miseducated. The other thing, too, is I've also had my friends tell me this. They go, they go, it's impossible to figure out what is the healthiest diet from the Internet. All we hear all day long is all these experts contradicting each other. And he says, you want to get no why at the bottom of it. Everybody just goes to MDs at a hospital. He says, because the average person, these are my medical friends saying this to me. They go, the average person, they think that whatever the doctor says is most likely to be helpful and correct and that these pills are really powerful it can make a difference. They think all this nutrition stuff is BS because all of these so-called experts are always contradicting each other. And so- Well, speaking of that, are you familiar with Dr. John Ion, I don't know if I pronounce his name right, Ionidas at Stanford? Yep, yeah. I I, I, I've tried to write him many times. He doesn't get back to me, but I'd love to have him on my show because my understanding is he actually looks at research and and- just looking at the research, not what we should do, but how the research was conducted and tells the truth about the research. Yeah, because I because that's the kind of the experience I had as well is that if you look at surgery, and I came from a surgery background, you have to do certain steps to successfully complete an operation. And that literature is pretty good. Okay, then I look at the radiology literature. Okay, you look at a CAT scan, you have a low density lesion in the liver, you can say, well, based on these criteria, it's a benign cyst, based on these criteria, it's a tumor. The radiology literature is pretty good. OK, but then you get to the internal medicine literature and the internal medicine subspecialties. It's a joke. It's it's ridiculous. It's like something out of the 1700s. It's so stupid. OK, almost every single chapter of internal medicine related diseases, they're all the same. No one knows what causes the disease. It's partly related to aging. It's partly related to genetics. Best option is just take these pills, hopefully slow it down. As the patient gets worse, then try surgery. OK, that's like all their chapters. And what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of, you know, really good literature out there. Well, gee, you know, you look at the literature, like all these type two diabetics reverse when they go low, low fat vegan and they lose the weight. Okay. Look at the, the Roy Taylor literature. Look at the hypertension literature. But, you know, why is it so hard for people? It's a delicious, affordable, sustainable way to eat that's good for the planet and the animals. I just, I'm befuddled. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised too, because it's, it's sort of like, you know, once I latched on, it's like, oh my God, this, I, I want to work in this area because you can help people so much with this, you know? And, and Dennis Burkett said the same thing. He says, once you realize the power of this, you know, high fiber plant-based diet, it's almost like most other stuff in medicine, almost by comparison, is almost like a waste of time, you know? Um, but it, the, the, the thing about it that, that makes it not so great is that there's no money in it. You do conventional medicine, you show up, you generate billing codes, you get paid. It's a, it's a fantastic business. It's an assembly line. All right. Versus, you know, with the, the plant-based world, you could do something magnificent, beautiful. No one cares. No money. <laughs> so there's no money in broccoli and potatoes. I have another question that was submitted in advance. This is from Christy. Dr. Rogers, on your Spartan plate, you showed a small calorie percentage for green vegetables. Does this mean that a good sized salad and what does it typically include? Well, if I, you know, in a perfect world, like let's say I had my own organic farm that I could just grow whatever food I wanted, I would eat a lot of salads. I would eat like two of them every day. But in the real world, you know, you got to go to the store, you got to buy them. They don't store that long. And I run out of them. So I try to have at least one every day. And I think most of them are fine. I don't worry about it too much. You know, theoretically, arugula has got more nitrates, you know, maybe a little more vasodilation from that. But as long as it's, you know, one of the common green ones, I just eat it. So I'll eat the romaine. I'll eat the spring mix. I'll eat the, the, the some of the other ones as well. I'm not too fussy about it. 
Um, and I, I'm like a lazy guy. I mean, I just want to get my food, go to sleep. I work a lot. I don't have the, I don't have a lot of time. Um, so I'm not that fancy because I know some people that want to enjoy their salad. They're putting tomatoes and all these other things. in. I think that's fine. Enjoy all your, your fruits and vegetables. As long as it's not nothing sprayed on it, that's toxic. They're all pretty healthy for you, but I, I'm not, I'm not the guy, you know, ask, ask Chef AJ. Okay. About all the different options to enjoy a salad. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I, I'm guilty of not eating a lot of salads unless somebody makes them. I bet I do eat a lot of vegetables, you know, cooked vegetables. Well, Dr. Rogers, thank you so much for your uh, wonderful presentations and all the time you spend preparing and giving them. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And even though you're not watching the Super Bowl today, I sure hope your team wins. I have no idea who's even playing. That shows you how much I know. Yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> And thanks everyone for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for Plant-Based Classics with Lauren Burnick and enjoy your Super Bowl, everyone.